It began a few nights after I settled in. I was tucked into bed, the house silent, save for the occasional creaks and groans of its old bones. Just as I was drifting off to sleep, I heard it. Footsteps. Slow, deliberate footsteps echoing down the hallway outside my bedroom door. I sat up, straining my ears. The footsteps continued, growing louder, closer. My heart raced as I considered the possibilities. Was there an intruder? But I had locked all the doors and windows. Gathering my courage, I flung open the bedroom door, expecting to confront someone. But the hallway was empty. The footsteps had stopped, replaced by an eerie silence. I checked every room, every possible hiding spot, but found no one. I tried to dismiss the incident as a product of my imagination, perhaps amplified by the stress of the move, but the footsteps returned the next night. And the night after that, always at the same time, always the same slow, echoing pace. Sleep became elusive. The anticipation of the nightly footsteps filled me with dread. I even set up cameras in the hallway, hoping to catch a glimpse of whatever was causing the sounds. But every morning, when I reviewed the footage, the hallway remained empty, even though the footsteps were clearly audible. Desperate for answers, I turned to my neighbors. An elderly couple, Mr. and Mrs. Thompson, lived next door and had resided in the area for decades. Over a cup of tea, I hesitantly shared my experiences. Mrs. Thompson exchanged a glance with her husband before speaking. This house has a history, she began. Many years ago, a young man lived there. He'd return home late every night, his footsteps echoing in the hallway as he made his way to his room. One fateful night, he never made it home. He was involved in a tragic accident and died. She paused, her eyes distant. They say that sometimes, places remember. The house remembers his footsteps, his nightly routine. It's as if it's stuck in a loop, replaying that sound over and over. I was taken aback. The idea that my house was echoing the past, that it was haunted by memories rather than spirits, was both fascinating and unsettling. Determined to break the cycle, I sought the help of a local medium. She performed a ritual, filling the house with the scent of sage and lavender. She spoke to the house, urging it to let go of the past, to find peace. That night, as the usual hour approached, I waited with bated breath, but the footsteps never came. The house was finally silent. Weeks turned into months, and the memory of the nightly footsteps began to fade. The house, once echoing with the sounds of a bygone era, now resonated with my own memories and experiences. But sometimes, in the stillness of the night, I think about the young man and the imprint he left behind. It's a haunting reminder of the thin line between the past and the present, and how places, just like people, can hold on to memories long after they're gone. The road trip was supposed to be straightforward. My family and I were traveling through the French countryside, heading towards the coast for a summer vacation. But when a fallen tree blocked our path, we were forced to take a detour. The narrow winding road led us through dense woods before opening up to reveal a quaint village nestled in a valley. Stone cottages with thatched roofs lined the streets and a crystal clear stream flowed through the center. It was picturesque like something out of a fairy tale. But what struck us most was the silence. There were no cars, no modern machinery. Instead, horses and carts moved along the cobblestone streets, and the villagers went about their tasks dressed in clothing that seemed centuries old. 
curious, we decided to explore. The villagers were friendly, greeting us with warm smiles, but there was a hint of confusion in their eyes, as if they weren't used to outsiders. We entered a small inn, hoping to grab a bite to eat. The interior was lit by candles, and the menu was handwritten on a chalkboard. As we ate, we chatted with the innkeeper, trying to learn more about the village. It's called Valombra, he said. We're a simple community, living off the land, just as our ancestors did. But why isn't Valombre on any map? I asked. The innkeeper looked uneasy. We've always been here, but the world outside, it seems to have forgotten us. As we continued our exploration, we noticed other oddities. There were no phones, no electricity. The village seemed trapped in time, untouched by modern advancements. At the village square, we met an elderly woman named Isabel. She spoke of Valombra's history, of a curse that had been placed on the village centuries ago by a scorned witch. The curse trapped the village in a timeless loop, preventing it from moving forward. The outside world changes, but Valombre remains the same, Isabel said with a sigh. We're trapped in this moment, forever. The weight of her words settled over us. The beauty of Valombra, with its old world charm, was overshadowed by the realization that its inhabitants were prisoners of time. As evening approached, we decided to leave, promising Isabel and the others that we'd find a way to break the curse. But as we drove away, the village began to fade, disappearing into the mist until it was gone entirely. We tried to retrace our steps, but the path to Valombre had vanished. It was as if the village had never existed. Back in the modern world, we searched for any record of Valombre, but found nothing. It was a mystery, a place lost to time. But we never forgot the village or its inhabitants. And every year, on the anniversary of our visit, we'd gather as a family and light a candle, hoping that somewhere in a timeless pocket of the world, Valombre and its people would find their way to freedom. The winding dirt road cut through the dark, dense forest as Andrea and I drove in uneasy silence. I had suggested we take this back road shortcut through the woods to get away for the weekend. But now regret gnawed at me as the encroaching trees and deepening dusk transformed the drive into an unsettling journey into the unknown. Andrea gazed out her window nervously as the gravel path twisted ever deeper into the gloom. Remind me why we're taking this way again? It's just a bit of scenic back road, that's all. I replied with a confidence I didn't feel. I flipped on the headlights, casting faint illumination onto the road ahead. It'll take us right to the cabin by the lake. Uh-huh, Andrea said skeptically. She was right to be apprehensive. Even I was growing uneasy, though I couldn't place why. These were just harmless rural woods, I told myself. But as we continued down the narrow lane, the forest seemed to close in oppressively. Strange noises echoed from the shadowy trees, raspy whispers, distant shrieks. It must be animals, I thought, tamping down the prickle of fear on my neck. Did you hear that? Andrea whispered, voicing my own dread. It's nothing, probably just some weird bird, I said, trying to sound casual. But then through the dense trees, I spotted a faint flickering glow up ahead. Look, there's a clearing. Let's check it out. Eager for any diversion from the creeping forest, I veered off towards the light. We parked at the edge of a large moonlit glade. Andrea peered nervously into the dark woods surrounding the open space. I have a bad feeling about this place, she began, but her words trailed off as we both stared in awe and confusion. There in the clearing stood at least two dozen ghostly figures clad in long robes and peaked hoods. Their forms glowed with an ethereal sheen, 
as they shuffled silently into a circle, carrying lit candles. Together, the phantoms began to chant in a long-forgotten tongue, their hollow voices overlapping in a hypnotic drone. What the hell? I breathed. Andrea gripped my arm, eyes fixed on the ritual unfolding before us. We huddled by the car like intruders as the candlelight illuminated the specters' shadowed faces inside their hoods. Then the tempo of the chanting quickened. The circle of entities swayed and convulsed as if building toward an occult crescendo. Andrea and I watched, paralyzed. The air buzzed with frightening energy that set my teeth on edge. We need to get out of here now, Andrea urged in a frantic whisper. Despite my fascination, I knew she was right. We were witnessing something ancient and evil that we were not meant to see. I turned the key and the car's engine roared to life, shattering the ghostly ritual's trance. The entities froze, their empty gazes finding us through the trees. Moving as one, they glided swiftly toward us, candles blowing out in a sudden gust of wind. Go! Andrea screamed. I slammed the car into gear and hit the gas, fishtailing onto the gravel road as the phantoms converged on the glade behind us. Heart pounding, I careened down the dark path until the spectral ceremony faded into the distance. At last we reached the main highway, welcomed by the glow of street lamps. The entity-infested forest lay miles behind us. Still shaken, Andrea and I continued on toward the cabin and tried to make sense of what we'd witnessed in that isolated clearing. Some ancient sect gathering to recreate their profane ceremonies, only visible under the full moon? Or ghosts eternally reenacting a dark ritual that bound them to those woods? We may never understand the secrets that lurk down winding wood drive. But we know to never again take that unholy shortcut through the forest. The entities that dwell there are not meant for living eyes. As I explored my new home, I stumbled upon a small room that seemed to be a child's bedroom. Time had left its mark, with peeling wallpaper and creaky floorboards. But what caught my attention was an old porcelain doll sitting on a rocking chair. She wore a faded blue dress, her hair neatly tied in a bun, and her glassy eyes seemed to gleam with an inner light. A small name tag around her neck read, Evelyn. There was something unsettling about those eyes. No matter where I moved in the room, it felt as if they were following me, watching my every move. I tried to shake off the feeling, attributing it to the stress of the move and my overactive imagination. Over the next few days, as I settled into the house, I couldn't shake off the feeling of being watched. Every time I passed the room, I'd glance in, and there she'd be. Miss Evelyn, her gaze fixed on me. One evening, to test my sanity, I turned the doll to face the window and left the room. But the next morning, she was back in her original position, her eyes locked onto the doorway. Curiosity piqued, I decided to research the history of the house. At the local library, I found old newspaper clippings and records. The house had once belonged to the Whitmore family. They had a daughter, Evelyn who tragically died at a young age. Devastated by the loss, her mother had commissioned a doll to be made in Evelyn's likeness, hoping it would provide some solace. The more I delved into the history, the more I began to connect the dots. Residents after the Whitmores reported strange occurrences, items moving on their own, soft giggles in the night, and the ever-present feeling of being watched. One evening, as I sat in the living room, I heard a soft humming coming from the direction of the child's room. I cautiously approached, the door creaking open to reveal Miss Evelyn, rocking gently in her chair, the room bathed in a soft, ethereal glow. Taking a deep breath, I addressed her. Evelyn, is that you? The room grew colder, 
and the doll's eyes seemed to shimmer. A soft voice, almost a whisper, replied, I'm lonely. Tears filled my eyes as I realized the truth. Evelyn's spirit was trapped, bound to the doll, longing for companionship and the life she never got to live. Determined to help, I reached out to a local medium. She conducted a seance, communicating with Evelyn's spirit. Through her, Evelyn conveyed her desire to be free, to move on and be reunited with her family. The medium performed a ritual, releasing Evelyn's spirit from the doll and helping her cross over to the other side. The atmosphere in the house immediately felt lighter. The oppressive weight of sadness lifted. Miss Evelyn, the doll, remained in the house, but her eyes no longer followed me. She sat in her rocking chair, a silent witness to the history of the house and the little girl who once called it home. I often think of Evelyn and hope that she found peace. Her doll serves as a reminder of the mysteries of the unknown and the thin line between the living and the dead. Motorcycling had always been my escape. The feeling of the wind against my face, the roar of the engine beneath me, the freedom of the open road, it was therapeutic. One sunny afternoon, I decided to take a ride through the scenic routes of Pennsylvania. My destination was a series of tunnels, known locally as the Timeless Tunnels, due to their old world charm. As I approached the first tunnel, I noticed its stone walls were covered in moss, and the entrance was darker than I expected. The moment I entered, an eerie silence enveloped me. The usual echo of the motorcycle engine inside a tunnel was absent. It felt as though the tunnel was swallowing sound itself. Emerging on the other side, I was met with a sight that made my heart skip a beat. The world outside was different. The modern cars I was used to seeing were replaced by vintage models from the 1950s. The billboards showcased products and movies from that era. People were dressed in styles long out of fashion. Confused, I pulled over at a nearby diner. The sign read, Betty's Diner, in neon lights. And a jukebox played tunes from artists like Elvis Presley and Chuck Berry. I took off my helmet and walked in, hoping to find some answers. The patrons looked at me curiously, my modern riding gear clearly out of place. I took a seat at the counter and a waitress in a polka dotted dress came over. What can I get you, hon? she asked with a smile. I ordered a coffee, trying to gather my thoughts. What's today's date? I finally asked. She raised an eyebrow but answered, July 12th, 1956. I choked on my coffee. It was impossible. Just moments ago, I was in 2023. I tried to explain my situation to the waitress, but she laughed it off, thinking it was a joke. Determined to understand what had happened, I decided to explore this version of the world. Over the next few days, I experienced the 1950s in all its glory. I danced to rock and roll, watched movies at drive-in theaters, and even attended a local fair. The world was simpler, the pace slower, and there was a sense of community everywhere I went. But as the days turned into weeks, a longing for my own time grew. I missed the conveniences of modern technology, the diversity and progress of the 21st century, and most importantly, my family and friends. One evening, as I was riding, I decided to revisit the tunnel, hoping it might hold the key to returning to my time. As I approached, the same eerie silence from before enveloped me. I rode through, holding my breath, and as I emerged on the other side, I was met with the familiar sights and sounds of 2023. Relief washed over me. I headed straight home, hugging my loved ones a little tighter that night. The experience in the tunnel and the 1950s remains the most surreal event of my life. I often wonder if it was a dream, a glitch in the fabric of time, or a glimpse into an alternate universe. But the memories are as vivid as any other, 
and I cherish the lessons I learned during my brief time in the past. The world has changed in countless ways over the decades, but the essence of humanity remains the same. And while it's essential to progress and look forward, sometimes a glance back can provide valuable perspective on the journey ahead. The town of Black Hollow had always been shrouded in mystery. At its heart lay an old, abandoned graveyard, said to be cursed. Legends spoke of restless spirits and eerie occurrences, tales that were passed down through generations. As a newcomer to the town, and an avid fan of the supernatural, I was naturally drawn to the graveyard. One overcast evening, armed with a flashlight and a sense of adventure, I ventured into the graveyard. The wrought iron gates creaked as I pushed them open, revealing rows of ancient tombstones, some so weathered that the names were barely legible. A thick fog blanketed the ground, giving the place an otherworldly feel. As I wandered among the graves, I felt an overwhelming sense of sadness. It was as if the very air was heavy with the weight of untold stories and unfulfilled dreams. I paused at a particularly old tombstone, its inscription reading, Here lies those who wander but never rest. That night, as I drifted off to sleep, I was jolted awake by a vivid dream. I was back in the graveyard, but it was different. The fog had lifted, revealing a moonlit landscape. The tombstones were no longer just slabs of stone. They were doorways, each leading to a different realm. From each doorway emerged a spirit, their forms varying from shadowy figures to more defined human shapes. They approached me, their eyes filled with a mix of curiosity and desperation. One by one, they shared their stories with me. There was a young woman who had died of a broken heart, her spirit forever searching for her lost love. A soldier who had perished in battle his soul tormented by the horrors he had witnessed. A child who had died too young, his spirit longing for the life he never got to live. Each night, a new spirit would visit my dreams, sharing their tales of sorrow, love, and redemption. It was both a blessing and a curse. While I was privileged to hear their stories, the weight of their pain was often too much to bear. Desperate for a reprieve, I sought the help of a local historian, hoping to find a way to break the curse. He spoke of a ritual, passed down through the ages, that could help the spirits find peace. It involved returning to the graveyard at midnight, lighting a candle for each spirit, and reciting an ancient prayer. With hope in my heart, I followed the historian's instructions. As I lit each candle and recited the prayer, I felt a shift in the atmosphere. The oppressive weight lifted, replaced by a sense of calm and tranquility. That night, my dreams were different. The spirits returned, but this time, they were at peace. They thanked me for helping them find closure, their forms slowly fading away, leaving behind a serene dreamscape. The curse of the Black Hollow graveyard was broken, but the memories of the spirits and their stories remained with me. They served as a reminder of the thin veil between the living and the dead, and the importance of listening to and honoring the tales of those who came before us. The host, Mrs. Waverly, was a kind elderly woman with a warm smile. She handed me the keys to room 13, a cozy space on the second floor overlooking the gardens. The room was beautifully decorated with vintage wallpaper, antique furniture, and a comfortable four-poster bed. Exhausted, I quickly settled in and drifted off to sleep. 
The night was restless. I was plagued by dreams of a young woman in period clothing, wandering the halls of the inn, her face etched with sorrow. In the dream, she would always lead me back to room 13, pointing to a portrait on the wall, her eyes pleading. I awoke with a start, the first rays of dawn filtering through the curtains. Shaken by the vividness of the dream, I noticed the portrait from my dream hanging on the wall. It was the same young woman, her gaze hauntingly familiar. Over breakfast, I struck up a conversation with Mrs. Waverley, casually mentioning the portrait in room 13. Her face turned pale, her cheerful demeanor replaced by a look of concern. You stayed in room 13? She asked, her voice barely above a whisper. I nodded, recounting my dream. Mrs. Waverley took a deep breath and began to share a tale that had become local legend. The young woman in the portrait was Lillian, the daughter of the original owners of the inn. She had fallen in love with a guest, a young artist who had stayed in room 13. Their love was passionate but short-lived, as he was called away to war and never returned. Heartbroken, Lillian spent her days in room 13, waiting for her love's return, until she passed away from a broken heart. After her death, guests reported strange occurrences in room 13, whispers in the night, fleeting glimpses of a figure in period clothing, and dreams of Lillian's tragic tale. The disturbances became so frequent that the room was closed off, left untouched for years. Mrs. Waverley, realizing her oversight in giving me the keys to that room, apologized profusely. But I reassured her, expressing my desire to help Lillian find peace. That evening, with the guidance of a local medium, we held a seance in room 13. The air grew cold as we reached out to Lillian, offering her solace and understanding. The medium conveyed a message from Lillian expressing her gratitude for being remembered and her desire to be reunited with her lost love. As the seance concluded, the atmosphere in the room shifted, a sense of calm settling over everything. The portrait of Lillian seemed to glow, her expression one of peace and contentment. From that day on, room 13 was no longer off limits. Guests who stayed there reported feeling a gentle presence, a guardian spirit watching over them. The Briarwood Inn became not just a B&B, &B, but a testament to the enduring power of love. A reminder that even in death, our stories continue, waiting for someone to listen and remember. The night was moonless and bitterly cold as I steered my rattling old car down the deserted back road. It was a shortcut I'd taken for years, but tonight the wind howled through dead trees with unusual menace. According to local legend, on certain winter nights like this, a phantom highway would appear branching off from this road, leading drivers to their doom. Though I brushed off such tales, a shiver ran through me as I squinted into the dark. Sure enough, my headlights suddenly illuminated a cracked asphalt path I'd never noticed before. A weathered sign read, Ghost Highway, enter at your own peril. An icy chill rippled through me. This must be the haunted road described fearfully by the townsfolk. Those who entered were never heard from again. Clearly, some force or entity lured travelers to their ends down this sinister passage. I hesitated gripped by both unease and morbid curiosity. The phantom road awaited, daring me to uncover its secrets, or sealing my fate. Curiosity won out, and I turned onto the crumbling pavement. My tires rumbled as if passing through a barrier between worlds. Instantly, fog rolled in, obscuring the way ahead. I drove slowly, squinting through the white veil that enveloped the car. The stories of this coast highway echoed in my mind. In Japan, 
a similar mist-shrouded road allegedly led to the realm of the deed, never allowing any to return to the land of the living. In Ireland, a phantom path was said to carry victims away, to be sacrificed to ancient pagan gods. What horrors awaited down this forsaken route? Glowing shapes began to form in the fog ahead. I gasped as they took the shape of hulking men with distorted faces and hollow eyes. They lurched toward the car, emitting unearthly moans. I swerved around the phantoms, breath racing. More began to stagger out of the darkness, clawing with spectral hands. It was as if the tortured souls of past victims now guarded this road, craving fresh prey. Tires screeching, I barely avoided the ghost's grasp. But escape seemed impossible. No matter how far I drove, the road stretched on endlessly ahead. Panic rose in my chest. I was trapped on this endless haunted highway that delivered all into the arms of horrors. In the rearview mirror, I noticed a vehicle approaching fast behind me. It was a battered old hearse, driven by a tall, shadowy figure in a wide-brimmed hat. The mysterious undertaker pursuing lone travelers to ferry their souls. As it drew closer, I noticed a coffin rattling around in the back, freshly filled. Was it meant for me next? I pushed the gas pedal down hard, speeding away from the sinister hearse. It kept pace, inching ever closer. Up ahead, I could make out a crumbling bridge spanning a churning black river. Passing over it might be my only escape from this nightmare road. I blew past the moaning ghosts and raced towards the bridge. Behind me, the hearse's headlights flared, blinding me for a moment. I swerved back on course, engine roaring as I neared the bridge. Rotting planks whizzed under my tires and I braced for the bumpy passage over the river. But instead, I emerged back into the blinding fog. Somehow the bridge had transported me back to the start of the ghost highway, trapped in an endless loop. The mysterious hearse was gone but the groaning phantoms still surrounded the car, seeking their next victim. Panic surged through me. I was doomed to drive this haunted road eternally until finally the fog spirits claimed me. But I had to fight. Gripping the wheel with white knuckles, I turned the car around back toward the bridge. It was my only hope of escaping this nightmare realm. The ghost's wails grew deafening as I raced back down the road. I would not share their fate. Up ahead, the bridge came into view once more. Flooring the gas pedal, I rocketed toward it faster than before. This time as I crossed the river, I did not slow down. I blasted over the bridge, screaming a defiant cry against the denizens of this haunted road. Blinding light enveloped me, along with the groans of a thousand lost souls. Suddenly, I was through. The fog vanished, and the smooth pavement of the main highway lay ahead, bathed in moonlight. Glancing back, there was no sign of the phantom bridge or spirits that prowled it. I had escaped the ghost highway's endless loop. Shaken, I drove on through the cold night, grateful to be back in the land of the living. But the haunted road calls still from the edge of town, beckoning the unwary into its eerie embrace. Those who listen and enter face an eternity trapped between worlds, never able to find their way back home. The old battlefield was a popular tourist spot known more for its historical significance than its rumored hauntings. I've always been a history buff, so when I had the chance to visit, I jumped at the opportunity, eager to walk the grounds where soldiers once fought and died. The day of my visit was overcast, the gray skies lending an eerie atmosphere to the vast open fields. As I wandered, I tried to imagine the scene all those years ago, the roar of cannons, the shouts of commanders, the desperate cries of wounded men. As evening approached, I found myself drawn to a particular spot on the battlefield, a small grove of trees. The air there felt heavy, 
charged with an energy I couldn't quite explain. I lingered for a while, lost in thought, before finally heading back to my hotel. That night, as I drifted into sleep, the dreams began. I was back on the battlefield, but it was no longer quiet and empty. The ground shook with the force of artillery fire, the air thick with smoke and the metallic scent of blood. All around me, soldiers clashed in brutal combat, their faces twisted in fear and determination. But the most unsettling part was the sound. The deafening booms of cannons, the whizzing of bullets, the anguished screams of men. It was all so vivid, so real. I could feel the heat of the explosions, the ground trembling beneath my feet. Each night, the dreams returned, each more intense than the last. I'd wake up drenched in sweat, the sounds of battle still ringing in my ears. Desperate for answers, I decided to revisit the battlefield, hoping to find some clue or explanation for my haunting dreams. I was drawn once again to the grove of trees, the epicenter of my unease. As I stood there, an old man approached me. He introduced himself as a local historian and shared that the grove was the site of a particularly bloody skirmish. Many soldiers had fallen there, their bodies never recovered, their spirits said to still haunt the grounds. He believed that some visitors, especially those sensitive to the energies of the past, could pick up on these lingering spirits, their memories seeping into the subconscious. Determined to find peace, I sought the help of a spiritual healer. She performed a cleansing ritual, using sage and chanting to clear any residual energies that may have attached themselves to me. She also gave me a protective amulet, infused with herbs and crystals, to ward off any unwanted spirits. Over the next few nights, the intensity of the dreams began to wane. The sounds of battle grew fainter, the images less vivid. Eventually, they stopped altogether, replaced by the usual mundane dreams of everyday life. The experience left a lasting impression on me, a reminder of the thin veil that separates the present from the past the living from the dead. It taught me that history is not just a series of events recorded in books, but a living, breathing entity, its echoes reverberating through time, waiting for someone to listen. The first note appeared on a Tuesday morning. As I reached for my coffee mug, I noticed a folded piece of paper under it. Unfolding it, I read, Don't trust him. The message was scrawled in a hurried manner, but the handwriting was unmistakably mine. Confused, I looked around my apartment, half expecting to find evidence of a break-in, but everything was in its place. I tried to brush it off, thinking maybe I'd written it in a half-asleep state and forgotten about it. But the unease lingered. Two days later, another note appeared, this time inside my laptop. Watch your back, it read. The chill that ran down my spine was undeniable. I live alone, and the thought that someone might be sneaking into my apartment was unsettling. But the fact that the notes were in my handwriting made it even more perplexing. The notes continued to appear over the next few weeks. He's watching. Don't go out tonight. Stay away from the window. Each message was more ominous than the last, and I felt like I was losing my grip on reality. I decided to set up a camera in my apartment, hoping to catch the culprit in the act. Each morning, I'd eagerly review the footage, but there was never any sign of an intruder. However, one night, the footage revealed something that left me stunned. Around 3 a.m., I saw myself rise from the bed, eyes vacant and expression blank. I walked to the desk, took out a pen and paper, and began writing a note. Once done, I placed it in a drawer and returned to bed, all the while remaining in a trance-like state. The realization hit me hard. 
I was writing the notes, but in a state of somnambulism, or sleepwalking. But why? And what did the warnings mean? Seeking answers, I consulted a sleep specialist. He explained that stress, trauma, or unresolved issues could trigger such episodes. He suggested undergoing a sleep study and also recommended seeing a therapist to explore any underlying emotional triggers. During therapy, I delved deep into my past and uncovered a repressed memory. Years ago, I had been in a relationship with a man named Alex. It started off well, but over time, he became possessive and abusive. One night, in a fit of rage, he threatened me, and I genuinely feared for my life. I managed to escape and moved cities, changing my identity to stay hidden. The therapist theorized that seeing someone in my new city who resembled Alex might have triggered these memories subconsciously, leading to the sleepwalking episodes and the warning notes. With this revelation, I decided to confront my past. I reached out to authorities and discovered that Alex had been searching for me, his obsession never waning. Every one of those notes was some part of me that knew, warning me that he was around. With the evidence I provided from the past, they were able to apprehend him. The notes stopped appearing, and my sleep returned to normal. The ordeal taught me the power of the subconscious mind and how it can protect us in ways we can't even fathom. While the journey was terrifying, it ultimately led me to confront my past and find closure. Our family road trips were always filled with laughter, games, and of course music. My wife, Aisha, our two kids, Maya and Sami and I, were on a summer drive through the heart of Virginia, heading towards the Blue Ridge Mountains. The landscape was picturesque, with rolling hills and dense forests flanking the highway. As we drove, I decided to scan the local radio stations, hoping to find some classic rock or perhaps a catchy pop tune. But what we stumbled upon was something entirely unexpected. The radio tuned into a station, WVLR Memories 88.9, and a soft, melodic song began to play. The lyrics spoke of a summer romance at a county fair, of stolen glances atop a Ferris wheel, and whispered promises under a starlit sky. Aisha suddenly gasped. I remember this that summer when we went to the county fair in Roanoke. We had our first kiss on the Ferris wheel. She looked at me with teary eyes, lost in the memory. But there was a problem. Aisha and I had never been to a county fair in Roanoke. We'd met in college in New York and had never visited Virginia until now. Before I could voice my confusion, another song began. This one was upbeat, detailing a family picnic by a lakeside with children laughing and playing in the water. Maya and Sammy's eyes lit up. That's like the time we went to Lake Anna and had that huge water balloon fight, Sammy exclaimed. Again, this was a memory that didn't exist. We'd never been to Lake Anna. Song after song, the radio played tunes that evoked memories we hadn't lived. There was the winter ballad that reminded Aisha of a snowy dance we'd never attended and the rock anthem that brought back memories of a concert where Maya had supposedly gotten her first guitar pick. The atmosphere in the car grew thick with a mix of nostalgia and confusion. It was as if the radio was tapping into an alternate timeline, playing songs from moments that had never occurred in our lives, but felt as real as any other memory. As the sun set, the signal began to fade and the mysterious WVLR Memories 88.9 was replaced by static. We drove in silence, each of us lost in our thoughts, trying to make sense of the phantom memories. We reached our destination, a cozy cabin in the mountains, but the events of the drive dominated our conversations. We speculated about the nature of memories, parallel universes, 
and the power of music to evoke emotions. That night, as the kids slept and Aisha and I sat on the porch, looking up at the stars, she whispered, even if those memories aren't real, they felt beautiful. It's like we got a glimpse into another life, another version of us. I nodded, wrapping my arm around her. Maybe in some other universe, those memories are real. And that version of us is reminiscing about our memories, wondering about a life where they met in New York and took road trips through Virginia. We laughed at the thought, but the magic of the forgotten playlist stayed with us. It was a reminder of the infinite possibilities of life, the countless paths not taken, and the beautiful moments that exist, whether we've lived them or not. It was supposed to be a simple road trip. My friends, Priya, Carlos, and I, had planned a weekend getaway to a cabin in the woods. The drive was straightforward, a four-hour journey through the heart of Oregon's dense forests. We set off early in the morning, our car packed with snacks, music playlists ready, and spirits high. As we drove, we chatted, sang along to our favorite songs, and admired the scenic beauty outside. About two hours into our journey, we approached a tunnel carved into the side of a mountain. The entrance was framed by old, moss-covered stones, and the inside was pitch black, the other end not visible. Carlos, who was driving, joked, feels like we're entering the twilight zone. We laughed, but as we entered the tunnel, an eerie silence enveloped the car. The radio lost signal, and our voices seemed muffled as if the very air inside the tunnel was absorbing sound. It felt like mere minutes before we emerged on the other side, blinking against the bright sunlight. We all let out a collective sigh of relief, the tunnel's oppressive atmosphere still fresh in our minds. But as we continued driving, something felt off. The landscape looked different, more overgrown, as if nature had reclaimed the area. The road signs indicated that we were only 10 minutes away from our cabin, which was impossible given we had at least two more hours to go. Confused, I checked my watch, expecting it to be around noon. But to my shock, it read 5.30 p.m. Priya checked her phone, and it showed the same time. We had somehow lost over five hours, but the journey through the tunnel had felt like mere minutes. Panic set in. We tried to retrace our steps, but everything was a blur. We remembered entering the tunnel, the silence, and then exiting into the changed landscape. When we reached the cabin, the owner, an elderly woman named Mrs. Adler, greeted us. Seeing our distressed faces, she invited us in for tea. As we recounted our experience, she listened intently, nodding occasionally. Once we finished, she sighed, Ah, the lost tunnel. I've heard tales, but you're the first I've met who's experienced it. She explained that the tunnel was ancient, older than any records could trace. Over the years, travelers had reported similar experiences, losing hours or even days after passing through. No one knew why or how it happened, but it was always on days when the sun was particularly bright, casting the tunnel into deep shadow. Mrs. Adler's words sent chills down our spines. We were grateful to be safe, but the lost hours weighed heavily on our minds. What had happened in the time we couldn't account for? The rest of the weekend was uneventful, but the mystery of the lost tunnel stayed with us. We decided to take a different route home, not wanting to risk another encounter. To this day, we still wonder about those lost hours. Were we in some sort of time warp? Did we experience things we couldn't remember? The answers remain elusive, but one thing is certain. The lost tunnel, with its ability to bend and steal time, is a reminder of the mysteries that still exist in our world, waiting to be discovered.
The painting caught my eye at a local estate sale. It depicted a figure, a woman dressed in a flowing Victorian era gown, standing at the edge of a dense forest. Her face was obscured by a veil, but there was an undeniable allure to her posture, a sense of mystery that drew me in. Without much thought, I purchased the painting and hung it in my living room. The first few days, it served as a conversation piece. Guests would comment on its haunting beauty, speculating about the identity of the woman and the artist who painted her. But as the days turned into weeks, I began to notice something unsettling. Every morning as I passed by the painting, it seemed as though the figure had moved ever so slightly. At first, I dismissed it as a trick of the light, or my imagination playing games. But day by day, the woman in the painting seemed to be inching closer, moving from the edge of the forest toward the foreground. I tried to rationalize it. Perhaps the paint was reacting to the humidity, or maybe the canvas was warping. But deep down, I knew something supernatural was at play. One evening, as I sat reading in the living room, I glanced up at the painting and froze. The woman was no longer at the edge of the forest. She was now at the very front of the canvas, her veiled face mere inches from breaking free. And as I stared, I could have sworn I saw the fabric of her veil flutter, as if caught in a gentle breeze. Disturbed, I decided to research the painting's origins. A deep dive into local archives led me to a tragic tale from the late 1800s. The woman in the painting was Lady Eleanor, a noblewoman who had vanished without a trace. She was last seen entering the very forest depicted in the painting, and despite extensive searches, no trace of her was ever found. Rumors swirled about her fate. Some believed she had been taken by spirits, while others whispered about a forbidden romance and a heartbroken departure. But one thing was clear. The artist who painted her was deeply in love with Eleanor and devastated by her disappearance. In his grief, he painted the haunting portrait, pouring all his longing and sorrow into the canvas. Realizing the situation, I sought the help of a local medium. She sensed a powerful energy emanating from the painting. The spirits of both Eleanor and the artist intertwined in a dance of love and loss. To free them, we held a seance. As the medium chanted, the room grew cold and the painting seemed to come alive. The forest in the background rustled and Lady Eleanor's veil lifted, revealing a face of ethereal beauty. A soft voice echoed through the room, expressing gratitude for being seen and remembered. With a final heart-rending sigh, the figure in the painting retreated returning to her original position at the edge of the forest. The room warmed and a sense of peace settled over everything. The painting remains in my living room, its beauty undiminished. But now when I look at it, I see not just a portrait of a lost noblewoman, but a testament to the power of love, a reminder that even in death, our stories continue, waiting for someone to bear witness. The basement had always been a place of mystery in our old family home. Growing up, it was the realm of forgotten relics, dusty boxes, and childhood dares. But as an adult, tasked with clearing out the house after my parents decided to downsize, the basement became a chore. One afternoon, as I sifted through boxes of old photographs and trinkets, I stumbled upon an old tape recorder. It was heavy its plastic casing yellowed with age. Curiosity peaked, I pressed play, expecting to hear a forgotten family memory or perhaps one of my childhood attempts at recording a radio show. Instead, a chilling voice filled the room. It was a man's voice, shaky and filled with desperation. Please, if anyone finds this, 
I need help. They're keeping me here. I don't know how much longer I can hold on. The message ended abruptly, replaced by static. My heart raced, a cold sweat forming on my brow. The voice was unfamiliar, and the sheer terror in it was palpable. I immediately contacted the local police. They took the tape recorder and after analyzing the recording they began an investigation. The house had been in our family for generations, and no one could recall any incident or person that might be connected to the voice on the tape. Weeks turned into months, and the mystery deepened. The police were unable to identify the man, or determine when the recording was made. The tape itself was old, but without a specific date or more information, leads were scarce. Determined to find answers, I began my own investigation. I scoured local newspapers and archives, looking for any mention of missing persons or mysterious events connected to our home. My search led me to a series of articles from the 1970s about a local man who had vanished without a trace. The man's photo bore a striking resemblance to a young version of a neighbor I remembered from my childhood, Mr. Grayson. I approached Mr. Grayson with my findings, and after some initial hesitation, he revealed a tale. In his youth, he had been involved with a group that dabbled in the dark side of the occult. Drawn in by the allure of forbidden knowledge, he soon found himself in over his head. The group, led by a charismatic but unhinged leader, believed in harnessing the energy of fear. Mr. Grayson had been chosen as their sacrifice, imprisoned and tormented to feed their dark rituals. One fateful night, he managed to escape, recording his plea on a tape recorder he found in the basement. He hid the recorder, hoping that somebody would find it and rescue him. But by the time he emerged from his hiding place, the group had disbanded, its members disappearing into the shadows. Traumatized, Mr. Grayson moved away, changed his identity, and tried to forget the past. He returned years later, believing the group was long gone, and that he could find some semblance of peace. The revelation sent shockwaves through our community. The police reopened the investigation, and with Mr. Grayson's testimony, they were able to track down and apprehend the remaining members of the group. The tape recorder, once a forgotten relic, had unveiled a dark chapter in our town's history. It served as a haunting reminder of the secrets that can lurk beneath the surface, hidden in the shadows of the past, waiting for the light of truth to reveal them. The atmosphere of the office changed at night. What was familiar in the daylight took on a different texture in the solitary glow of my desk lamp. I was working late, again, plowing through spreadsheets and emails in the eerie quiet. I had just clicked over to a new task when it happened. My computer screen blinked for a second, and then words began appearing in a blank Word document. Check the Thompson report. You missed a detail in the second paragraph. My hands hovered over the keyboard, fingers suspended in confusion. I was alone in the office, I was certain of that. Even the janitors had already finished their rounds. My mind raced to my old mentor, Karen. She would always catch those little mistakes, the almost invisible details most people would overlook. She had passed away five years ago, a sudden illness that had taken her far too young. People in the office said her work ethic and dedication were unmatched, right up to her last days. Hesitant, I clicked on the Thompson report and skimmed to the second paragraph. Sure enough, I had made an error, a subtle one, a misplaced decimal that could easily have been overlooked, but would have altered the financial summary. A chill crept up my spine. Was this some elaborate prank? Some strange glitch? I looked around my dimly lit office, half expecting to see Karen's stern but encouraging face peering out from behind a bookshelf. But the room was empty. Refocusing on the screen, I corrected the error. 
As soon as I did, another message appeared on the blank document. Good catch. Don't forget to cross-reference the inventory data. It was exactly the kind of tip Karen would give. The kind of meticulous step she insisted could make or break a project. Nervously, I opened the inventory data and began cross-referencing. Within minutes, I found another oversight. Minor to anyone else, but crucial in the grand scheme of things. The night wore on and the tips kept coming. Review the meeting agenda. Double check the new contract. The formatting on slide 7 is inconsistent. Each tip pointed to a flaw or an oversight that I would have missed, but Karen would have caught. Finally, as the clock neared midnight, a different message appeared on the screen. You're ready for tomorrow. Trust yourself. It was a classic Karen phrase, a seal of approval she'd grant only when she thought you had met her exacting standards. I leaned back in my chair, staring at the words on the screen. The room felt colder, but not in an unwelcoming way. It was as though the air had thickened with purpose, brimming with a silent but palpable intent. I didn't hear from Karen after that night, not in the way I did during those haunting midnight hours. My presentation the next day went smoothly, every detail falling perfectly into place, every tip Karen had provided proving invaluable. Days turned into weeks and the eerie events of that night transformed into a blur, a surreal experience that mingled with the reality of deadlines and meetings. Yet every time I catch a detail I would have otherwise overlooked, or when I take an extra minute to review something most would deem trivial, I can almost sense Karen's approving nod, a silent affirmation from a presence I can neither explain nor forget. Growing up, I had an imaginary friend named Mr. Whispers. He was tall, with elongated limbs and a shadowy face, always obscured by the brim of his old-fashioned hat. As a child, I found comfort in his silent presence. He'd appear in my room, sitting in the corner, watching over me as I played with my toys or read books. Whenever I felt lonely or scared, I would talk to him. And even though he never spoke back, I always felt understood. As I grew older, Mr. Whispers faded away, becoming just a distant memory of my childhood. I went on to college, started a career, and settled into adulthood, leaving behind the whimsical beliefs of my youth. But a few months ago, things changed. I had just moved into a new apartment, and as I was unpacking, I stumbled upon an old drawing I had made as a child. It was a crude sketch of Mr. Whispers, his tall figure looming over a smaller depiction of me. Nostalgia washed over me, but it was accompanied by an uneasy feeling, a prickling sensation at the back of my neck. That night, as I lay in bed, I heard it, a soft rustling sound like fabric brushing against the floor. I turned on the bedside lamp, and there he was. Mr. Whispers, standing in the corner of my room just as I remembered him. But something was different. His posture was more menacing, and the room felt colder. I tried to convince myself it was just a dream, a trick of my tired mind. But night after night he returned, and unlike the silent guardian of my childhood, this Mr. Whispers was more aggressive. Objects would move on their own, doors would slam shut, and I'd wake up with unexplained scratches on my arms. One particularly terrifying night, I woke up to find him hovering over my bed, his face inches from mine. For the first time, I heard his voice, a deep, guttural whisper. You left me behind. I decided to seek help. I contacted a local paranormal expert hoping to find answers. As I described my experiences, he listened intently his expression growing more serious. Imaginary friends, he began, are often manifestations of child's emotions or desires, but sometimes they can be something more sinister, entities from another realm that latch onto the innocence of a child. 
He believed that Mr. Whispers was one such entity, and now that I had acknowledged him again, he had returned, stronger and more malevolent. The expert performed a cleansing ritual in my apartment using sage and chanting ancient incantations. As he worked, the atmosphere grew tense, and I could feel Mr. Whispers' anger. But as the ritual neared its end, there was a loud, piercing scream, and then silence. The expert left me with a protective talisman and instructions to keep it close. Entities like Mr. Whispers, he warned, are never truly gone. They wait for a moment of weakness to return. It's been weeks since that night, and I've had no further encounters with Mr. Whispers, but I often wonder about the nature of imaginary friends and the thin line between childhood fantasy and paranormal reality. I keep the talisman close, a constant reminder of the unseen world that lurks just beyond our perception. The pendant was an unexpected discovery hidden beneath the floorboards of my newly purchased Victorian home. It was a delicate piece with a deep blue gemstone set in ornate silver. The moment I clasped it in my hand, a rush of emotions flooded over me, fear, sorrow, and a deep sense of longing. That night, as I drifted off to sleep, the dreams began. I found myself in a bustling town square the surroundings unfamiliar yet oddly comforting. The attire, the architecture, everything hinted at a time long past. In this dream world, I was a young woman named Ilara, living a life of privilege but bound by societal expectations. Night after night, the dreams delved deeper into Ilara's life. I felt her joys, her heartbreaks, and her secret love affair with a man named Samuel, a talented blacksmith. Their love was passionate but forbidden, as Ilara was promised to another, a wealthy merchant named Lord Blackthorn. The dreams grew more intense, culminating in a fateful evening. Samuel had crafted a pendant for Ilara, the same one I had found as a symbol of their undying love but their secret rendezvous was discovered by Lord Blackthorn. In a fit of rage and jealousy, he confronted Alara, and the confrontation turned deadly. The last thing I felt in the dream was a sharp pain, the world fading to black, the pendant slipping from Ilara's grasp. I awoke with a start, the weight of Ilara's memories pressing down on me. The pendant wasn't just a piece of jewelry, it was a link to a past life, a life cut tragically short. Determined to find closure, I began researching the history of my home and the town. The local archives revealed a tale that mirrored my dreams. Ilara and Samuel were real, their love story a tragic chapter in the town's history. Lord Blackthorn, consumed by guilt, had become a recluse and the pendant was lost to time. With the truth revealed, I felt a duty to honor Ilara's memory. I sought out Samuel's descendants, discovering that his great-great-grandson was a historian living in the same town. Together we erected a memorial in the town square, commemorating the love story of Ilara and Samuel ensuring their tale would never be forgotten. The dreams ceased, but the pendant remained with me, a tangible connection to a past life. It served as a reminder of the cyclical nature of existence, the idea that love transcends time, and that sometimes the universe grants us a chance to right the wrongs of the past. The forests of Maine have always been a sanctuary for me, a place where I can lose myself in the serenity of towering trees and hidden lakes. 
But during a late summer camping trip in one of the state's more secluded forests, that sanctuary would become the setting for an experience so bizarre, it shook the very foundations of what I thought I knew about the natural world. After a day spent hiking and fishing, I settled into my campsite as night began to fall. The air was thick with the scent of pine and damp earth, and the only sounds were the gentle rustle of leaves and the distant hooting of an owl. As I sat by my campfire, engrossed in a book, I felt a sudden change in the atmosphere, a subtle but palpable shift that made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. That's when I heard it, a low, almost guttural growl emanating from the woods beyond the circle of firelight. I snapped my head up, scanning the darkness that surrounded me, but saw nothing. Still, the feeling of being watched, of not being alone, continued to grow. Clutching my flashlight, I decided to investigate. Guided only by the narrow beam of light and my mounting trepidation, I moved cautiously through the trees, my senses heightened, my footsteps muffled on the forest floor. Then I saw them, eyes, two glowing orbs floating just above ground level, staring directly at me. My heart pounded as I aimed the flashlight at them, revealing a creature unlike anything I had ever seen. Covered in dark, mottled fur, it was hunched over, its long, sinewy arms almost touching the ground. But it was the creature's face that captivated me, a haunting blend of human and animal features with an almost sorrowful expression. As our eyes met, the creature let out a soft, mournful cry, a sound that echoed through the woods and seemed to reverberate within me. Suddenly, as if startled by its own vulnerability, the creature swiftly turned and disappeared into the forest, its form blending seamlessly into the darkness, leaving me alone with my shock and disbelief. I returned to my campsite, my mind racing. Had I just encountered a cryptid? One of those mythical creatures that exist on the fringes of science and folklore? My thoughts turned to local legends of the Turner Beast, a mysterious creature said to roam the Maine woods, and I wondered if what I had seen was connected to these tales. Sleep did not come easily that night, and when dawn broke, I packed up and left, driven not by fear, but by an overwhelming sense of awe and wonder. As I made my way back to civilization, I felt a profound shift in my understanding of the world, a newfound respect for the mysteries that still linger in the hidden corners of our planet. I've returned to those woods several times since that night, always with a sense of anticipation and reverence, hoping for another glimpse of the unknown. And while I have yet to encounter the creature again, the experience remains etched in my memory, a constant reminder that in the depths of the main forests, something extraordinary waits, existing in the space between legend and reality. The night was dark and the road empty as I drove home from my late shift at the factory. The radio played softly, but static filled the silence between songs. I yawned, exhausted after the long day's work. Just a few more miles and I'd be home to my warm bed. That's when I first heard it, a woman's voice singing. It cut through the static, an eerie, haunting melody. I turned up the radio wondering if a new song was playing, but only white noise came through. The singing continued, wordless and distant. It seemed to come from outside the car. I drove on, puzzled. 
Out here on these rural back roads, there was nothing but trees and the occasional farmhouse. Where could the singing be coming from? It grew louder, like a siren's song, beckoning me onward. The voice was at once captivating and chilling. Without thinking, I began to drive faster, compelled by the hypnotic song. The voice led me down a narrow dirt road I'd never noticed before. On either side, the forest loomed dark and impenetrable. The melody spiraled higher, impossibly beautiful and yet unearthly. I should turn back, I thought vaguely, but the compulsion to follow overpowered me. The road curved and dipped until I realized I no longer knew where I was. The voice kept calling. At last, I rounded a bend, and there stood an ornate iron gate, adorned with creeping ivy. It stood open, leading to a cobblestone path that disappeared into the shadows. The singing resonated all around now, at once, coming from everywhere and nowhere. Against my better judgment, I parked and stepped out of the car toward the gate. I had to find the source of the haunting song. As I passed through the gate, the singing stopped abruptly. The silence rang in my ears. The path led to the steps of a Victorian mansion that seemed abandoned. The paint peeling, the lawn withered and overgrown. Yet a faint light flickered from one curtained window. I climbed the steps to the front door. My body shook, equal parts fear and exhilaration. What would I find within? Again, desire compelled me to turn the tarnished knob and enter. Inside lay only gloom and a chill that raised the hairs on my arms. Cobwebs draped the furniture, and the air smelled of decay. I nearly turned to run, but then the melody began once more. It came from upstairs, a mournful refrain like a lover's lament. My gaze fixed on the winding staircase, every instinct screaming at me to flee this dreadful place. Still I climbed, one step after another. The ancient floorboards creaked underfoot as I ascended. The singing grew louder, almost directly overhead now. At the top, I found myself in a long hallway, lined with more peeling doors. Only one stood ajar, a room at the end from which the song poured. I drifted toward it, my breath shallow, my blood roaring in my ears. Reaching out with trembling fingers, I pushed open the door. Moonlight spilled in through a broken window, illuminating the crooked form of a woman in white sitting before a cracked mirror. Her long, dark hair hid her face as she combed it slowly and sang. I stood frozen. Her song had led me here, but now that I had found its source, I was terrified. Sensing my presence, the woman turned. Her gaunt face was pale as death her eyes black pools that fixed my own. But most horrible was her mouth, impossibly wide, nearly splitting her face in two, revealing rows of jagged teeth. As her song shifted to a bone-chilling shriek, she rose like a wraith, hair writhing about her like shadowy tendrils. I turned and fled even as she glided after me, nails clawing. I stumbled down the stairs and out the front door to my car. Behind me came the shrieks as the house seemed to come to life, shuddering and swaying. I drove off in a frenzy, swerving back down the dark path until I reached the main road. The thing's cries pursued me, furious at my escape. At last I reached home, collapsing in my bed as dawn broke outside. Yet I still hear her ominous song in my dreams, calling me back to that nightmare manor deep in the woods. And I know one night soon, Despite my terror, I will return. For her haunting melody is a siren's call I cannot resist, no matter the peril. The roadside singer awaits to make me hers forevermore. I was driving through the winding roads of West Virginia, the dense fog making visibility almost nil. The radio forecast had warned of such conditions, but I was determined to reach my destination by nightfall. 
As I rounded a bend, I was met with an unexpected sight, a traffic jam. Cars, buses, and trucks were at a standstill. But these weren't modern vehicles. They were all from the 1940s and 50s. People dressed in period clothing stood outside their cars, looking just as confused as I felt. I stepped out of my car, trying to make sense of the situation. A man in a fedora approached me. Hey there, buddy. Been stuck here for hours. Seems like there's been an accident up ahead. I nodded, deciding to investigate the cause of the jam. As I walked further, the scene became more chaotic. There were overturned vehicles, and people were shouting and crying. At the center of it all was a bus, its front mangled, having collided with a truck. A woman, her dress torn and face covered in soot, approached me. Please, sir, can you help us? We can't seem to move on. It hit me then. This wasn't just a traffic jam. It was a scene from a tragic accident that had occurred decades ago. These were the trapped souls of those who had perished, unable to find peace. Determined to help, I approached the bus. Inside, I found a group of children, scared and crying. They were on a school trip when the accident happened. I spoke to them gently. It's time to go home. Your families are waiting. One by one, the children began to fade, their spirits finding the peace they had been denied for so long. Outside, I approached the drivers of the bus and the truck. Both were filled with guilt and sorrow. It wasn't your fault, I told them. Accidents happen. It's time to forgive yourselves and move on. As they disappeared, the scene around me began to change. The overturned vehicles righted themselves and the cries and shouts faded away. The fog lifted, revealing a clear road ahead. I returned to my car, the weight of what I had witnessed heavy on my heart. The ghostly traffic jam was gone, but the memories would stay with me forever. It was a stark reminder of the fragility of life and the importance of finding peace, both in life and in death. And as I continued my journey, I sent a silent prayer for all the souls I had encountered, hoping they had finally found the rest they so desperately sought. I've always been an outdoorsy type eager to explore every inch of the world's natural beauty. The main woods were no exception, and I'd ventured deep into them countless times. Every now and then, locals would talk about eerie occurrences, disappearances, strange cries at night, and even whispered legends of a creature known as the Rake, an almost skeletal humanoid entity with elongated limbs and lifeless eyes. I dismissed these tales as old wives' tales, but I would soon regret my skepticism. It was late July, and I was taking a solo trek through the forest to clear my mind. The canopy of green above me was a comforting sight, and the songs of birds echoed in the distance. I'd set up camp near a creek enjoying the solitude and the symphony of water trickling over the rocks. As darkness fell, I prepared a fire and settled into my tent, my flashlight and Swiss army knife within arm's reach, just in case. The air was unusually dense that night, thick with a tension that draped over the forest like a dark veil. I shook off the feeling and slid into my sleeping bag dismissing it as the product of an overactive imagination. In the dead of night, a rustling outside my tent yanked me from my sleep. My heart pounded as I grabbed my flashlight, unzipping the tent just enough to poke my head out. The beam of light danced through the trees, but found nothing. Slightly relieved, I told myself it was probably just a raccoon or a squirrel but the tension in the air still held its grip on me. I tightened the zipper and returned to sleep. 
Not long after, I was awakened again, this time by an unholy screech that echoed through the woods. It was a sound that defied description, like the scream of a woman combined with the roar of an animal. I felt my blood freeze, my body paralyzed with fear. As quickly as I could, I put on my boots and grabbed my knife. With a flashlight in hand, I stepped outside the tent. The forest had fallen ominously silent. Even the creek seemed to murmur more quietly, as if aware of the dread that hung in the air. I began to move cautiously, my flashlight cutting through the dark. I told myself I would investigate only a little before turning back. Just when I thought I couldn't handle any more suspense, I saw it. A figure no more than 50 feet away was hunched over, drinking water from the creek. It was skeletal, but covered in patches of skin, its elongated limbs disturbingly human, yet entirely wrong. I nearly dropped my flashlight when it turned toward me, revealing hollow eyes that seemed to absorb the light. In that moment, I felt a terror that eclipsed all rational thought. My legs carried me back to my tent faster than I'd ever moved. I tore it down in record time, throwing everything into my backpack. I didn't look back until I was well away from that clearing. And even then, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was still being watched. When I finally emerged from the forest, bathed in the first light of dawn, I knew something had changed in me. The woods would never again be a sanctuary. They were now a place where nightmares could step out of the shadows and into reality. I never reported my experience, knowing the ridicule and skepticism that would greet me. Even now, years later, I can't find a logical explanation for what I encountered that night. But one thing is certain. The cryptic legends of Maine's forests hold a truth far more terrifying than any tale. And whatever that creature was, it's still out there, lurking in the depths of the woods. And so I tell you this story with a warning. Be wary of the forest's edge, for beyond it might lie horrors that defy understanding. It was a foggy evening as I drove through the winding roads of the Appalachian Mountains. The mist was thick, reducing visibility to just a few feet ahead. As I rounded a bend, I spotted a figure on the side of the road, thumb outstretched. Given the weather and the remoteness of the location, I decided to stop. The hitchhiker was a young woman, dressed in a faded floral dress that looked like it belonged to another era. Her eyes were a deep shade of blue, and there was a certain sadness about her. Thank you, she whispered as she climbed in. I need to get to Silver Pine. I was taken aback. Silver Pine was a town that had been abandoned after a mining disaster in the 1940s. Are you sure? There's nothing left of Silver Pine. She nodded. It's where I need to be. We drove in silence, the only sound being the hum of the engine and the occasional droplets of rain hitting the windshield. As we approached the old location of Silver Pine, the fog grew denser. The hitchhiker pointed to a dilapidated sign barely visible through the mist. Just up ahead, she said. I slowed the car, trying to navigate through the thick fog. When I turned to ask her for more specific directions, I found the passenger seat empty. The door was still closed, and there was no sign of her anywhere. Confused and a little frightened, I continued driving until I reached the remnants of Silver Pine. The town was a ghostly sight, with decaying buildings and overgrown vegetation. In the town square, there was a memorial with names of those who had perished in the mining disaster. Curiosity got the better of me, and I approached the memorial. As I scanned the names, one caught my attention. 
Lila May Thompson. Below the name was a picture of the young woman I had picked up, wearing the same faded floral dress. A chill ran down my spine. I quickly got back in my car and drove away, the image of Lila May's sad blue eyes etched in my mind. The fog began to lift, and as I looked in the rearview mirror, Silver Pine disappeared into the mist, along with the phantom hitchhiker who had once called it home. It started out subtle at first, a glimpse of unfamiliar scenery in the rearview mirror that was gone when I looked back, a car that seemed to vanish as it drove behind me. I brushed it off as just tired eyes playing tricks on me during long and lonely drives. But the visions in the mirror gradually intensified, like a radio tuned between stations, flickering between realities. Until finally, one night on an empty stretch of highway, the image behind me shifted completely. Instead of the dark road receding into the distance, I saw a bright, sunny day and a car that was not mine. Inside was myself, but with slightly different hair and clothing. He looked happy, content, and next to him sat a woman, my wife, but not as I knew her. Her hair was shorter, face a little smoother, eyes shining as she smiled at the other me behind the wheel. I slammed the brakes in shock. This was no trick of the eyes. The mirror had become a window into another world, one where it seemed life had taken me down a different path. As my heart pounded, the other me cruised along, chatting and laughing, blissfully unaware of my gaze. I drank in every detail hungrily, envious of his confident air, the affection between him and his wife. My knuckles white from gripping the steering wheel, I feared blinking lest the vision dissolve. When I finally continued driving, I could not tear my eyes from the mirror. Mile after mile, it tracked that other, happier version of my life. Days when I knew only loneliness and regret, he spent in parks and beaches with his family. Nights I wasted in bars or numbly staring at a TV screen. He enjoyed cozy dinners and long talks with his smiling wife. It all seemed so perfect, so effortless for him. Why hadn't I made different choices? The mirror became an addiction, my evening fix, feeding an insatiable craving for that life untaken. I left work early each day racing to get behind the wheel, hungry for my glimpse of what could have been. My wife's face when I got home barely registered. I was fixated on the wife who waited behind the glass each night as I drove away again. Until finally, one rainy evening, my car hydroplaned on a slick curve. The world spun out of control, and I had one last frozen instant to see the other me still driving happily onward, unaware of my fate then everything went black. I drifted back into consciousness, the sting of antiseptic in my nose. My wife sat at my hospital bedside, her face lined with worry and fatigue. As I struggled to speak, tears welled in her eyes. There were times I thought you wanted a different life, she said softly. But in the end, you were always devoted to this one. The truth sank in, even through the fog of pain medication. That other winding road had never really existed. My weaknesses and mistakes were my own, not some cosmic injustice. All I could do was go forward from here, striving to rediscover the best parts of myself again. Maybe the mirror had been a warning, or even a gift, a glimpse of how every choice shapes our lives. I can't change the past but I can still steer myself toward a brighter future if I keep my eyes focused ahead. The road behind me no longer haunts my thoughts. Wherever the highway leads next, the only way is forward.
The Pacific Northwest is known for its lush landscapes, dense forests, and misty coastlines. But on one of my solo road trips through Washington State, I encountered something far more mysterious than the usual scenic vistas. I was driving along a coastal route, the ocean waves crashing against the cliffs to my right. As the afternoon sun began its descent, I approached a long suspension bridge named Elysian Crossing. I hadn't seen it on any map, but it seemed like a shortcut to the next town. As I began my ascent onto the bridge, a dense fog enveloped the area, reducing visibility to just a few meters. But halfway across, the fog cleared suddenly, revealing a breathtaking sight. A sprawling city on the horizon, its skyline unlike any I'd ever seen. Towering spires shimmered with golden light, and intricate buildings seemed to float above the water. Entranced, I continued driving, eager to explore this mysterious city. But as I reached the end of the bridge, a disorienting sensation washed over me. The city vanished, and I found myself back at the entrance of Elysian Crossing, the bridge stretching out before me once again. Confused, I pulled over at a nearby diner. The place was quaint, with a few locals sipping coffee at the counter. I asked the waitress about the bridge and the city I had seen. Her face turned pale. Oh, so you've seen the Mirage City, she whispered. She beckoned an older man, introduced as Mr. Lee, to join us. He began, Elysian Crossing has been here for as long as anyone can remember, and so have the tales of Mirage City. It's said to be a reflection of a city from another time, or perhaps another dimension. Those who see it are said to be chosen. Chosen for what? I asked. Mr. Lee shrugged. Some say it's a blessing, a glimpse into a utopian future. Others believe it's a warning, a reminder of the transience of our existence, but no one really knows. All that's certain is that you can't reach the city. Many have tried, only to find themselves back at the start of the bridge. I left the diner with more questions than answers. That night, I camped nearby, the silhouette of the Elysian crossing visible from my tent. I dreamt of the Mirage City, its streets filled with people from different eras, all coexisting harmoniously. The next morning, I attempted to cross the bridge again, but the city didn't appear. It seemed my glimpse of the Mirage City was a once-in-a-lifetime experience. I continued my journey through the Pacific Northwest, but the memory of the bridge and the city stayed with me. Whether it was a vision of a possible future or a mere trick of the light, the Elysian Crossing and its Mirage City served as a reminder of the mysteries that exist just beyond the veil of our understanding. When I first toured the apartment, I was immediately drawn to its spacious rooms, high ceilings, and large windows that let in an abundance of natural light. However, there was one peculiarity, a locked door in the hallway. The landlord, a middle-aged man with a somewhat nervous demeanor, quickly brushed off my inquiries about it, saying it was just an old storage room, nothing to be concerned about. I moved in excited to start this new chapter in my life. The first few days were uneventful, filled with unpacking and decorating. But then the noises began. Every night, precisely at midnight, I'd hear it. Soft, persistent scratching coming from behind the locked door. It started as a faint sound, almost like the scurrying of a mouse. But as days turned into weeks, it grew louder more desperate. Curiosity and unease growing, I approached my landlord again, pressing him for more information about the room. He hesitated, then finally relented, sharing a story that had become something of an urban legend in the building. Years ago, the apartment had been occupied by a reclusive artist. 
He was rarely seen, always engrossed in his work. Rumors swirled about his obsession with a particular piece, a project he kept hidden in that very room. One day, he disappeared without a trace, leaving behind all his belongings. The only sign of his presence was the locked room, from which strange noises could be heard. The landlord admitted that no one had been able to open the door since, and over time it was simply accepted as a quirk of the building. Determined to uncover the truth, I decided to take matters into my own hands. With the help of a locksmith, the door was finally opened, revealing a dimly lit room covered in a thick layer of dust. The walls were adorned with various paintings, each more haunting than the last, but the centerpiece was a large canvas in the middle of the room. It depicted a dark, shadowy figure, its form almost human, but with elongated limbs and sharp, claw-like fingers. The background was a chaotic blend of colors, giving the impression of movement and turmoil. As I stared at the painting, a chilling realization washed over me. The scratching noises, the desperate sounds. It was as if the figure was trying to escape the confines of the canvas. Wanting to rid my home of this eerie presence, I contacted an art historian, hoping to gain insight into the painting's origins. She was fascinated by the piece, noting its unique style and the palpable energy it exuded. After extensive research, she discovered that the artist had dabbled in the dark side of the occult, using his work as a medium to channel and trap restless spirits. The shadowy figure in the painting was believed to be one such entity, bound to the canvas by the artist's dark rituals. Realizing the gravity of the situation, I sought the help of a spiritual expert. He performed a cleansing ritual, releasing the trapped spirit from the painting and ensuring it could no longer harm anyone. The painting was safely stored away, and the room was sealed once more. The nightly scratching ceased, and a sense of peace returned to the apartment. The experience served as a reminder of the power of art and the thin line that separates our world from the unknown. It taught me that some doors, both literal and metaphorical, are best left unopened, and that behind every locked door lies a story waiting to be told. A month after Lucy's funeral, the first letter arrived. It was an ordinary Tuesday, filled with drizzling rain and the monotony of my nine-to-five job. The beige envelope stood out in the pile of bills and junk mail, and the handwriting caught my eye immediately. Cursive loops and intricate swirls. It was Lucy's handwriting. I opened it cautiously, my hands trembling a bit. The letter inside unfolded effortlessly as if it couldn't wait to spill its contents. It detailed a childhood memory, the time we'd built a treehouse in the backwoods behind our old house. The narrative was so precise that it felt like I was reliving the moment. The smell of the fresh cut wood, the feeling of scraped knees, the thrill of secrecy. Only Lucy and I knew about it. A lump formed in my throat. Lucy had died in a car accident. It was sudden and it was brutal, and here was a letter speaking in her voice about events only she would know. Over the next few weeks, more letters arrived. Each envelope was identical, each letter more intimate than the last. They recalled secrets we'd shared, fights we'd had, and the intricate bonds we'd formed as sisters. The letters never explained where they came from, and there was never a return address. It felt both comforting and unsettling to read these letters. Comforting because in those moments I could almost hear Lucy's laughter and feel her presence. Unsettling because with each letter, the walls of reality seemed to thin and I started questioning my own sanity. I decided to confront my family, but when I showed the letters to my mother, her eyes filled with a blend of hope and sorrow as if she wanted to believe but couldn't afford to. 
My dad just shook his head, muttered about forgeries, and retreated to his home office. The final letter broke the pattern. It described the night Lucy left the house for the last time, how she was running late, how she'd forgotten her lucky charm bracelet. The bracelet had been a gift from me, and it was something she never took off. Yet after the accident, we couldn't find it. In the letter, Lucy wrote that she had wished she'd turned back to get it, almost did, but decided against it. The last line was, take care of mom and dad, Soph, and take care of yourself. I miss you. I didn't receive any more letters after that. It was as if Lucy had said her final goodbye, making peace with her untimely departure. I found myself torn between relief and an aching emptiness, as if a chapter had closed but left me holding a book with missing pages. Months later, while cleaning the attic, I stumbled upon a small, tarnished box. Inside, cushioned on a bed of faded velvet, was Lucy's lucky charm bracelet. I still don't know how it got there, wedged between old yearbooks and dusty Christmas decorations. And maybe I'll never know, but that's okay. Maybe some questions are better left unanswered. I'm from Northern British Columbia, Canada. A few years ago, my friend invited me to join him, his mother, and sister at a resort beside a lake roughly 90 minutes from our town. This trip occurred at the cusp of June and July. Now, I term it a resort because while it has a primary log building, which functions as both a check-in spot and a restaurant, it's mostly just a collection of log cabins with spaces near the lake for RVs. So, resort is in very heavy air quotes. The location is predominantly surrounded by expansive forests, with the only real disruption being the highway that slices through the woods. Despite a few scattered houses around the lake, it's generally a quiet area, unless it's a holiday weekend. A winding road connects the cabins to the main building, which is a brief five to eight minute walk. Beyond the main structure, there is a clearing with tables, seemingly untouched for a decade given the overgrown vegetation around them. A short distance from these tables, within the woods, lie two lagoons encircled by an old wire fence. We arrived in the evening familiarized ourselves with our cozy log cabin and began exploring. The first day was fairly uneventful, but the next day's overcast and rainy weather was surprisingly welcome. It ensured fewer visitors, granting us more freedom. Our explorations led us to the clearing with the old tables, which clearly hadn't been used in ages given the encroaching nature. Delving further, about 50 feet into the woods, we discovered the lagoons. An intriguing detail was a section of the wire fence, flattened as if a large animal had passed over it. We nonchalantly dismissed it and continued our exploration, intending to return later. However, our next visit was cut short by strange noises, reminiscent of footsteps from the previous day's path. This experience kept us on edge, but we rationalized that it might just be the local wildlife. Despite the unsettling atmosphere, we even ventured to another forested spot near the cabins, where, oddly enough, we heard echoes of our own actions. It was like somebody mimicking our branch-breaking sounds. This was even more unsettling when we realized the unlikelihood of another person being in that same remote spot. Later that evening, our attempts to recreate the sounds were interrupted by a strange and frightening sight, a shadowy figure hiding behind a tree. Panic took over and we fled back to our cabin. That night's discussion was more sober as we tried to make sense of the figure and the sounds. Fast forward a year and we were back, this time with an additional friend. 
We briefed him about our prior adventures, which he met with skepticism. Yet the ensuing days made a believer out of him. Our encounters this time were mostly around the lagoon area. We again heard the footsteps, and on our last day, a terrifying, indescribable screech. Investigating, we were met with a sudden, massive sound of something heavy hitting the ground. We fled in terror, only to later encounter a black bear, which, to our astonishment, seemed just as afraid and bolted away. It wasn't afraid of us, either. It was running from the direction where we had just had our encounter. It barely even looked at us. As I contemplate revisiting this year, I recount this story to seek insights. Two distinct entities seem to reside there the elusive woodsman or tree knocker, and the aggressive entity that we have dubbed the Screecher. Despite scouring the internet, I have found no similar experiences. Does anybody have insights or theories about these mysterious presences? The location, despite its oddities, is genuinely picturesque and offers great amenities. It's known as a Purden Lake Resort, with a notable green roof. Anyway, I welcome any theories about what might be lurking there. Flat tire. Middle of nowhere. No cell reception. The trifecta of a road trip gone bad. I cursed under my breath as I surveyed the situation. My car sat lopsided on the gravel road, as desolate a spot as you could imagine. The sky was beginning to bruise with twilight, and the prospects of changing a tire in the dark were far from appealing. Just when I thought things couldn't get worse, headlights appeared in my rearview mirror, a pickup truck, ancient but well-kept, slowing down as it approached. A sliver of hope. Maybe I wasn't so unlucky after all. The truck parked behind me and out stepped a man, older, weather-beaten but spry. His overalls were stained with years of oil and grit, the name Eugene embroidered above his heart. Looks like you could use some help, he said, squinting at my flat tire. Would be much appreciated, I replied, relief washing over me. Eugene moved with a quiet efficiency unpacking his toolkit and getting to work. His hands were strong, deft, each movement precise. In no time, he had the flat tire off and the spare on. There you go, he said, wiping his hands on a rag. Good as new. I couldn't believe my luck. How much do I owe you? He waved a dismissive hand. Consider it a favor. Just pay it forward when you can. I thanked him profusely still awed by the timely intervention. As he drove away, his truck's taillights faded into the encroaching darkness, as if swallowed whole. When I got back into town, I headed straight for the nearest garage to get a proper tire replacement. While there, I mentioned Eugene and how he'd helped me out. The mechanic paused, his face turning a shade paler. Did you say Eugene? Drives an old Ford pickup? Yeah, that's him. Know him. The mechanic looked at me as if I'd grown a second head. Eugene's been dead for years, passed away in that very truck, a collision up on Millersfield Road. A cold shiver trickled down my spine. That's impossible. He helped me just a couple hours ago, changed my flat tire and everything. The mechanic stared, then walked over to a cluttered bulletin board on the wall. He shuffled through various papers and pulled out a faded newspaper clipping, handed it to me. The headline read, Local Mechanic Dies in Tragic Accident. And there he was, Eugene, unmistakable despite the grainy black and white photograph, that familiar smile, those wise eyes. I felt my knees weaken, my stomach turn. Looks like Eugene's still looking out for folks, the mechanic murmured reclaiming the article and pinning it back on the board. I left the garage in a daze, new tire in place, but my understanding of reality 
irrevocably altered. I had been helped by a man who was no longer of this world, a long-dead handyman, still aiding travelers in distress. As I drove away, the thought weighed on me, heavy but oddly comforting. Whatever force let Eugene linger, it was a benevolent one, a shred of goodness stitched into the fabric of an otherwise indifferent universe. And as I merged onto the highway, my eyes flicked to the rearview mirror, half expecting to see those headlights one more time. But all that met my gaze was the open road and the gathering night. The long stretch of midnight highway unfurled before me as I drove through the rugged countryside. This desolate road was a shortcut to my destination, but my grip tightened on the wheel as local legends surfaced in my mind. Locals had spoken of this highway's hauntings, phantoms who preyed upon lost travelers. I tried to shake off my nerves. Ghost stories were merely fiction after all. But alone on this forgotten route, I could not ignore the chill creeping down my spine. My headlights illuminated a battered sign, Scenic Route 7. This remote byway was said to be plagued by a variety of supernatural horrors. In Ireland, nearly identical roads held the same name and tales of spirits known as Wailing Women, their shrieks echoing as they searched eternally for their lost children. In Japan, an analogous winding highway crossed the forest of Aokigahara, infamous for its yurei, ghosts of the forgotten. But the local legend that unnerved me most centered around a phantom hitchhiker. Stories told of a young woman dressed in white standing on the roadside, silently begging for a ride. Any driver who dared stop for her soon disappeared, never to be seen again. My gaslight suddenly blinked on and my stomach dropped. I was running low on fuel, still miles from civilization. With no choice, I kept driving down the pitch black road. The rocky cliffs around me seemed to close in as a dense fog rolled across my path. I could barely see ahead when through the mist, I spotted a faded sign for a gas station. Grateful, I veered off towards the weathered building. Perhaps they still provided services to wayward travelers like myself. But as I pulled up, not a light shone in the decrepit station. A rusty old pump stood unused amidst weeds. Everything about the place screamed abandonment, except for one detail, a yellow payphone under an overhanging roof. Could it possibly still work? Worth a try, since my cell had no signal. I dug for loose change in my glove box and walked over. The payphone's cracked receiver felt heavy and cold in my hand. I lifted it to my ear, deposited my coins, and miraculously heard a dial tone. Quickly I punched 911, seeking aid or at least directions. One ring, then two. Suddenly a girl's voice answered, her tone strange and distant. Please, help me. I jumped, taken aback. I cautiously asked who was speaking, but she only replied again, now clearly desperate. Please, you must help. He's coming. Her plea sent a chill through me, but I pressed for details. Where was she? What was happening? The voice grew fainter, as if speaking from the end of a long tunnel. Her last words sank my heart. He's here. He's... Then only static. I slammed the receiver down, breathing fast. This was no 911 call. Dread flooded my veins at the implication. Somehow I had connected directly with the ghost girl hitchhiker herself, calling across dimensions for aid. I ran back to my car, throwing it into gear. Peeling out back onto the road, I pushed the gas pedal to the floor. But only minutes later, through my headlights piercing the night mist, a shadow took shape. The silhouette of a young woman emerged. My blood turned to ice. It was her. The phantom wore a gossamer white dress, raven hair flowing untamed over her face. 
She stood utterly still, thumb outraised. Every fiber of my being screamed not to stop, but her form drew closer in my high beams, her thumb still desperately lifted. Against all reason, I pulled over, though never stopping fully. Perhaps I could help free her spirit. She floated to my passenger window, peering in, and then I saw her face, skin paler than snow, eyes jet black and devoid of life. Her beauty was chilling, otherworldly. This was no trapped soul, but something far more sinister. Ancient instinct took over, and I floored the gas. The phantom smile stretched unnaturally wide as I left her behind, fading back into the fog. I raced onwards, pursued only by my pounding heart. Local legends were true. This was a haunted highway, stalked by a deceiving, vengeful ghost. I dared not glance back to see if she followed still. Only the road ahead mattered now. I drove until I reached the highway's end, where it rejoined the main interstate. The disappeared into dawn's first light. But I know I'll never take the haunted detour of Road 7 again. For some journeys lead places from which we can never return, waylaid forever by the spirits that walk our darkest byways. The old, wrinkled map called to me from the dusty shelves of my grandfather's study. As a child, I had spent hours poring over its faded contours and landmarks, dreaming of the adventures it promised in foreign lands. But one road had always captivated my imagination, Route 00. It meandered whimsically across the map, not seeming to connect any two points in particular. My grandfather said he had never discovered where it led, though he had searched for years. When I inherited the map after his passing, the unfinished business of Route 00 beckoned. I set off on a journey to trace its path, hoping to uncover the secrets behind this mysterious road. Mile after mile I followed it, the dotted line leading me through forests and valleys, over hills and streams. Food and fuel dwindled as the days wore on, but I pressed forward, drawn irresistibly by the promise of what lay ahead. The road grew steadily narrower and less maintained. With each turn, the surroundings grew more ominous, the way ahead darker. Still I continued, shadows now seeming to creep from the woods to encircle me. Finally, the crumbling pavement dwindled to a single dirt track through the gnarled trees. My heart pounded as I glimpsed a small light shining in the distance. This was what I had been searching for all along. I stumbled into a clearing, where the moldering remains of an old carnival lay sprawled before me. This was a place that time had forgotten, that the world had left behind. As I walked slowly past the decaying tents and rides, memories of my childhood began flooding back, of warm summer nights spent at the county fair with grandfather. A carousel sat silent, once bright horses faded and peeling. In the hall of mirrors, I saw reflections, not of myself, but of friends and family, long gone. Around each corner lay a glimpse into my past, sending me deeper down forgotten paths in my own mind. I wandered for what felt like hours through the abandoned carnival, each exhibit triggering another vivid memory. The fun house with its warped mirrors took me back to the time I got lost as a child and stumbled out in tears. The broken down roller coaster reminded me of laughing wildly while clinging to my grandfather's arm. With every step, the past became more real than the decay surrounding me. I found myself mentally revisiting moments I hadn't thought of in years. The first time I rode a bike, school dances, graduations, it was as if this place held within it the very essence of my memories. Finally, I arrived at the abandoned Ferris wheel, rising skeletal against the night sky. One last carriage waited, as if beckoning me aboard for a final ride. I stepped into the creaking car, and as the wheel lurched into motion, 
began a slow ascent into the darkness above. Looking down, the road that had led me there now seemed to stretch on without end, two paths diverging, one into memory and one into infinite unknown. As the carriage rocked higher, pulling me away, flickers of past regrets and unrealized dreams began to play before my eyes. I saw the paths not taken, the risks not ventured, but interspersed were memories of accomplishments, loved ones, moments of joy, a kaleidoscope of memory and emotion engulfed me, somehow more vivid and real than anything in my present life. I knew then the truth about Route 00. It leads wanderers not to any physical place, but deep into the recesses of their own hearts, minds and fears, revealing their secrets. Whether it was real or only a dream, I may never know. But I emerged from that forest changed, Memories made vivid again, mysteries of my own heart illuminated. The journey itself was the destination. Route 00 is an invitation to reckon with where you've been, who you became along the way, and where those winding back roads of life might yet lead, if you dare to follow them. I work as a bartender in a quaint town nestled in the suburbs of Vancouver, British Columbia. The establishment I work at is housed in a heritage building, standing proudly on the main street. Over a century old, it opened its doors, I believe, as a hotel in the 1920s, or perhaps even earlier. From the moment I began working there a year ago, whispers of a resident ghost circulated among the staff. My general manager and co-workers would recount their eerie experiences, unexplained events that left a chill in the air. More than once, as we settled the cash register at the end of the night, items that had no reason to fall would spontaneously tumble, startling us. Inconsequential things, like plates with sugar or salt, would suddenly take on a foreboding presence. However, one particular night stands out, an experience so strange that I still grapple with its reality. It was nearing midnight, our official closing time, and the only souls remaining were my general manager, the chef, a line cook, and a friend who awaited my shift's end. Given the peacefulness of the evening, I had wrapped up my duties early and decided to step outside for a cigarette. Adjacent to the bar is a liquor store, accessible from the back of our building. A stairway leads down to the back street, and to the right there's a door to a shared storage room, which proves handy if we ever run low on supplies during a busy evening. Only a privileged few, my general manager among them, possess a key to this room. As my cigarette neared its end, I began my ascent up the stairs. Midway, I noticed a hand from within, pulling the back door closed. The light from the room streamed out, and I presumed my general manager had ventured in, perhaps to retrieve something. However, as I entered the bar, there he was, seated as before. Puzzled, I said, I just saw someone slip into the storage room. I thought it was you, but here you are. His casual demeanor shifted in an instant. Rising briskly, we both headed to the storage area. He unlocked the door, disarmed the alarm, and scoured the room. Moments later, he returned, confirming that the room was empty. We often play pranks on each other, but the gravity of my expression assured him that this wasn't one of those times. With a mix of amusement and unease, he said, Well, it seems like you've had your introduction to our resident ghost. Welcome, I guess. The highway was a ribbon of darkness, 
my truck's headlights barely making a dent. Mile after endless mile, I'd been listening to country songs and chugging lukewarm coffee. There's a rhythm to the road at night, a hum that can hypnotize you if you're not careful. My eyes started to blur, a dangerous lull seeping into my bones. That's when I saw her, a figure on the side of the road, draped in what looked like a white shawl. Odd. People don't usually walk along interstates at 3 a.m., not in places like this, where the closest town is a good half-hour drive away. Something about her posture said she wasn't hitchhiking, wasn't lost. She seemed to be waiting for something or someone. My first instinct was to drive past. Maybe it was fatigue. Maybe it was the jaded part of me that thought it was some sort of setup. But something compelled me to pull over, tires crunching on the gravel shoulder. She approached the truck without hesitation, as if she'd been expecting me. No face, just darkness under the hood of her shawl. But when she spoke, her voice was young, almost melodious. Do you seek fortune, driver? I almost laughed. Fortune was a long shot for a guy hauling freight cross country. More like decent mileage and good coffee. Her head tilted, considering. Follow me, she said. And then she turned away, floating, yeah, floating, about a foot above the ground. My instincts screamed not to, but I was suddenly overtaken by curiosity. Shifting the truck into gear, I trailed her as she glided smoothly along the edge of the road. The whole setup screamed of legends, of La Llorona, or the Japanese Yurei. But this wasn't Mexico or Japan. This was a lonely stretch of American asphalt. Eventually, she led me off the highway onto an unmarked dirt road. My truck bumped and jostled, and for a moment I feared I'd lose her in the dust and darkness. But she was always just ahead, an eerie beacon. The road ended abruptly at the entrance to what looked like an abandoned barn. She stopped and turned toward me. Inside, you will find what you seek. I should have bolted right then, turned that truck around and sped back to the sanctuary of the highway. But I didn't. Instead, I stepped out and walked into the barn. The wood creaked under my weight, dust motes floating lazily in the slivers of moonlight that snuck through the gaps in the slats. There was something on a rickety table at the center, half buried under a tattered cloth, a metal box with an intricate lock. I reached out hands trembling. Before I could touch it, a cold wind blasted through the barn, extinguishing what little light there was. My heart hammered in my chest. I groped around, grabbed the box, and bolted back to my truck. The figure was gone. I didn't open the box until I'd driven a good hundred miles. Inside, nestled in faded velvet, was an antique pocket watch. I grabbed it and flipped it open. The time was stuck at 3.15, the exact moment I'd first seen her. Only then did it hit me. What if she'd led me to something darker, something malevolent? I felt a shiver creep up my spine, but by then, the road was pulling me again, back into its monotonous hum, and the night stretched long and endless ahead. My dog, Max, has always been a good judge of character. He's the kind of dog that would wag his tail at strangers, but growl if he sensed something off. So when he began barking at a specific corner of my room every night, I took notice. It started subtly. Every night around the same time, Max would grow restless. He'd pace around the room, his eyes fixated on the corner. Then he'd bark loud warning barks that would make the hair on the back of my neck stand up. I'd check the corner, but there was never anything there. No bugs, no strange shadows, nothing. This routine continued for weeks. I tried rearranging the furniture, cleaning the corner thoroughly, even placing a small lamp there to dispel any shadows. But nothing worked. Max's nightly barking persisted. 
One evening, after a particularly long day, I was lying in bed, reading a book with Max by my side. As the clock neared the usual time, Max began to growl, his gaze fixed on the corner. I sighed, preparing myself for the inevitable barking, but this time was different. As I turned my head to look at the corner, my heart skipped a beat. There, standing amidst the dim light, was a shadowy figure. It was tall and slender, its form wavering as if made of smoke. It had no discernible features, just a dark silhouette that seemed to absorb the light around it. Frozen in fear, I could only watch as the figure slowly moved, its form shifting and swirling. Max's barks grew louder, more frantic. The figure seemed to acknowledge him, turning its head slightly in his direction. Gathering my courage, I reached for the lamp on my bedside table and switched it on. The room was flooded with light, and the shadowy figure vanished instantly. The following day, I contacted a local paranormal investigator, desperate for answers. He arrived with an array of equipment and began his investigation. After several hours, he sat me down and shared his findings. The corner of my room, he explained, had an unusually high electromagnetic reading. Such readings, he said, were often associated with paranormal activity. He believed that the shadowy figure was a residual entity, a remnant of some past event or emotion trapped in a loop. He performed a cleansing ritual using sage and salt and placed protective talismans around my room. As he worked, Max watched intently occasionally wagging his tail. That night, for the first time in weeks, Max slept peacefully. The corner remained just a corner, devoid of any shadow figures. Days turned into weeks and the incident became a distant memory. Max's nightly barking ceased and the room felt lighter, more welcoming. I often wonder about the shadowy figure. What was its story? Why was it trapped in that corner? But some mysteries, I suppose, are best left unsolved, and all I know is that I'm grateful for Max, my loyal protector, always alert to the unseen dangers lurking in the shadows. I was driving the empty stretch of highway late at night, glancing at the peeling billboards littering the roadside. Most displayed dull ads for cheap motels and roadside diners. But one caught my eye, a blank white sign marked only with black lettering. Turn back now. A prickle ran down my neck. It seemed less a warning than a dark prophecy. But I shook off my unease and drove on through the creeping fog. Miles later, Another mysterious billboard emerged. Last exit, one mile. Again, a creep of dread. These signs almost seemed to know my presence here, long after midnight on this abandoned route. I chalked it up to fatigue and the mist playing tricks. But soon, more ominous messages began to take shape in the haze. We have been waiting. Your journey ends here. Each gave me a start, my imagination spiraling. Who was sending these silent warnings? Distracted, I nearly missed a faded placard peeking from the thicket. Turn back, dead end ahead. I slowed, gripping the wheel. This deserted back road was a shortcut I'd taken for years without incident, but the sign's persistent warnings filled me with foreboding. Still, only a few more miles to go. I pushed on warily. That's when it emerged ahead a towering billboard stark against the darkness. Last chance. My breath caught. Dread coursed through me, but the road ahead remained smooth and empty. With a shaking laugh, I dismissed my fears as fanciful. The messages were merely pranks, not grim portents. But then, around a sharp bend, my headlights fell upon one final board, rooted in the dirt shoulder. Its message turned my blood to ice. Sarah, we are waiting for you. The breath left my chest. My name on this remote road, impossible yet undeniably real, 
These were no pranks, but dire warnings from an unknown force. I floored the gas pedal, swerving around the last sign. Had to outrun this nightmare highway with its messages from beyond the void. Tires squealing. I raced on through the dark, eyes wild for a branching road to escape this valley of omens. But the way ahead remained stubbornly straight and desolate, my only choice forward or back. And then, behind me, a new light flared, harsh and blinding. An engine roared, drawing closer until it loomed large in my rear view. An unmarked white van, creeping up fast, headlights seeming to glow with malevolence. My terrified gaze jumped back to the road ahead. No exits, no turnoffs to shake my pursuer. The van edged nearer until it was just feet from my bumper, high beams flooding my car. Trapped on this road between darkness and darkness, this was the end the omens foretold. So I made my choice, floor the gas and leave the road entirely. My car jolted down the rocky shoulder, slamming into the ditch. The van blared past, unable to follow. Wheels spinning, I gritted my teeth and slammed the pedal down, fighting to climb out of the gully. With one last grunt of effort, my battered car lurched back onto the pavement. The white van was gone, its high beams fading into the distance. I rolled to a stop, hazard lights blinking, breath heaving. A close call. But I'd escaped the road's omens, and my pursuer along with it. Relief flooded through me as I steadied my shaking hands. But relief faded to chilling awe as I peered behind me. At the spot where I left the road, there stood no ditch or rocky drop-off, only more cracked pavement stretching unbroken into the past. No gully existed to have trapped me. There was no earthly reason I should be free. The full force of realization hit me. This was no ordinary road. Something beyond reason led me here, and now let me go, spared from the grim fate the signs foretold. Numb. I drove on until finally reaching safe asphalt and lamp-lit streets. But I knew now never again to take that darkness-veiled back road. For I had glimpsed the void and those who dwell beyond. By some grace, I slipped free this time. But next time, I may not escape the highway's messages from beyond. The waiting ones would have their due. In 2003, fresh out of high school, I was living in a quaint town in the Rocky Mountains of British Columbia. Despite its breathtaking altitude and scenic views, it was a place with a small populace, exuding a distinctly rural vibe. One night, my best friend and I found ourselves lounging in her Honda Civic. We had parked on a secluded dirt road, deep within the woods ensconced by trees with a clearing overhead. As we chatted away, reveling in the melodies of our favorite tracks and enjoying some devil's lettuce, the clock neared one o'clock in the morning. Out of the blue, a strange phenomenon occurred. Every inch of our surroundings, the sky above and even the interior of our car, were illuminated by an intense neon blue light. This glow, which lasted for about two to three seconds, was unique because it was completely omnipresent. It didn't cast a shadow. It didn't really have a source. It wasn't like a spotlight. It felt as if the light permeated everything and vanished as quickly as it appeared. Our initial reaction was shock. We first thought maybe it was the police, but a quick scan of our environment confirmed our isolation no soul in sight, and the town was enveloped in its usual nocturnal stillness. Without exchanging many words, driven by a sense of unease, we started the car and made our way home. To this day, we have no idea what that light could have been.
My eyes were already heavy, the dashboard clock flashing 2.37 a.m. as my car cruised along the near-empty Arizona highway. I had been driving from Tucson to Sedona for a long overdue solo retreat. The road was a dark ribbon flanked by towering saguaros and jagged hills. The only light coming from my headlights and the occasional star that peeked through the cloudy sky. I was reaching for my thermos of coffee when it happened. The radio, which had been playing a soft country tune, suddenly erupted into static. Annoyed, I fumbled with the dials, trying to find another station, but to no avail. And that's when I saw her, a woman in white, on the side of the road. Startled, I stepped on the brake. In the split second that it took to slow down, my rational mind kicked in. What would a woman be doing out here in the middle of nowhere, especially at this hour? My foot almost hit the gas pedal to keep going, but something made me stop. She was young, maybe in her early 20s, her white dress glowing in the dark. Her dark hair covered her face, obscuring it from view. As I pulled over, my gut tightened. This was against my better judgment. But what if she was in trouble? I rolled down the passenger side window a couple of inches. Hey, do you need help? I called out. The woman looked up, her face now visible, and what I saw made my heart skip a beat. Her eyes were completely black, no whites or irises, just a void of darkness. Can you give me a ride? Her voice was a whisper, but it echoed in my car as if she were sitting right next to me. Every fiber of my being screamed to drive off, yet I was paralyzed, trapped in her gaze. Then from the depth of my subconscious, an old Native American proverb my grandmother used to tell me surfaced. Never lock eyes with evil, for it will consume you. Summoning every ounce of willpower, I looked away, my hand gripping the gear shift. As I prepared to accelerate, she let out a wail, a terrible, mournful sound that seemed to reverberate in the air long after it stopped. When I glanced back to where she stood, or where she should have been standing, she was gone, vanished. I floored the gas pedal, my car shooting forward as if jolted by my own adrenaline. The radio blinked back to life, resuming the country song where it had left off as if nothing had happened. I didn't stop until I reached Sedona, and even then I couldn't shake the unsettling feeling that had enveloped me. Later, as I recounted my experience to a local, he nodded gravely. Sounds like La Llorona, he said, referring to the weeping woman, a famous ghostly figure in Hispanic folklore. She's been seen on these roads before. You're lucky you drove away. Whether it was La Llorona or something else entirely, I can't say, but I do know that the experience forever altered my perception of what lies beyond the realm of human understanding. Now, whenever I find myself driving on lonely roads in the dead of night, I can't help but wonder what, or who, might be lurking just beyond the reach of my headlights. Symphony Hall, home to the Boston Symphony Orchestra, is renowned for its flawless acoustics and architectural splendor. Little did I know, however, that the hallowed hall is also played host to sounds from beyond our realm. I had recently joined the team as an audio technician, a job that often required me to be in the hall during odd hours, testing equipment, and ensuring everything was set for performances. One evening, after the last musician had left, I stayed behind to calibrate a new sound system. With the vast hall empty and silent, 
I set to work. Suddenly, the unmistakable sound of a violin filled the room. The melody was mournful, yet beautiful, echoing through the hall with perfect clarity. Initially assuming that a musician had stayed behind to practice, I followed the sound to its source. However, when I reached the main stage, it was completely empty. The music, meanwhile, seemed to be emanating from a specific seat in the audience. Approaching cautiously, I found an old photograph on the seat. It was of a young woman, violin in hand, her eyes reflecting a deep passion for music. Puzzled, I showed the photograph to an elderly janitor who had worked at Symphony Hall for decades. His face turned pale as he shared the tale of Eleanor, a prodigious violinist from the 1920s, touted to be the next big sensation in classical music. On the eve of her debut performance at Symphony Hall, she tragically passed away, her dream of playing on the grand stage left unfulfilled. Legend had it that her spirit still visited the hall, playing her violin, pouring her soul into every note, ensuring her music resonated in a place she held so dear. Skeptical, yet intrigued, I placed a recorder in the hall every night. Each morning, I would find a new recording of a mysterious violin solo, each more poignant than the last. Though I never saw Eleanor's spirit, I felt her presence every time I stepped into Symphony Hall. Her haunting melodies became a testament to the undying passion artists hold for their craft, transcending even the barriers of life and death. Now, when the lights dim and the audience settles, I often close my eyes, listening intently, hoping to catch a note or two from Eleanor's violin. A spectral serenade forever echoing within the walls of Symphony Hall. Anyone who's taken a history class knows about the Old North Church in Boston's North End. Its steeple was where two lanterns were hung as a signal in 1775, indicating the British were coming by sea, leading to Paul Revere's infamous midnight ride. I lived a few blocks away and often took evening strolls around the area, relishing its historical ambiance. However, one evening's encounter turned my casual walks into something more profound. It was around midnight, the streets deserted and the church bathed in a soft moonlit glow. As I approached the church, I noticed a faint light emanating from its steeple. Curious considering the time, I moved closer, trying to get a better view. That's when I saw them, two shadowy figures moving around the belfry, appearing to hang lanterns. Their movements were methodical, a practiced choreography rooted in purpose. Frozen in place, I watched as the figures completed their task and stood still, looking out into the distance as if waiting for something or someone. Moments later, the faint sound of horse hooves echoed in the silence, growing louder with each passing second. As the sound approached its zenith, a spectral figure on horseback galloped past me, his form translucent, but unmistakably that of Paul Revere. The apparition sped through the North End's winding streets before disappearing into the mist, leaving behind an odd stillness. The figures in the belfry, their duty done, slowly faded away, their silhouettes merging with the shadows of the church. I stood there, heart racing, realizing I had just witnessed a reenactment of one of the most pivotal moments in American history. It felt as though the past had momentarily bled into the present, a testament to the city's rich background of events that shaped the nation. After that night, my walks near the Old North Church took on a new significance. I never saw the ghostly figures again, but I often paused, gazing up at the steeple, feeling an overwhelming connection to the generations that walked these streets before, their spirits forever intertwined with Boston's bricks and cobblestones.
I never really gave much credence to stories about the unexplained or the supernatural. Ghosts, UFOs, cryptids. I lumped them all into the category of campfire tales and tabloid fodder. But one late night drive through the desolate stretches of Arizona's highways changed all that. I was traveling from Flagstaff, a drive I'd made countless times before. It was around 1 a.m., and the night was as clear as it gets, the sky peppered with stars. The highway was empty, save for the occasional truck or car that would soon pass, a fleeting encounter with another soul in this vast, dark expanse. My playlist was running low on songs, and my caffeine high was starting to wear off. I told myself another hour and I'd be in Flagstaff, out of this car, in bed. That's when I saw it. The shape, or rather shapes, far ahead on the road. As I got closer, the shapes started to take form. They looked like animals, but not any animals I'd seen before. They were large, too large to be coyotes, and their gait was awkward, kind of hunched and erratic. I slowed down as I approached them. They seemed to be crossing the highway, completely unbothered by my car. The first instinct was to grab my phone and snap a picture, but as I reached for it, one of the creatures turned its head to look at me. Its eyes glowed an eerie, unnatural shade of yellow. I froze, my hand hovering over the phone. The look in those eyes was unsettling, inexplicably so. It wasn't just animal curiosity. It was almost as if it recognized me, or recognized that I recognized it. And then, as swiftly as they had appeared, they were gone, disappearing into the scrub and cacti on the side of the road. I sat there, still slowed to a near halt, my hands trembling on the wheel. I drove off, my heart pounding and my mind racing. Rational explanations came and went. Desert barrages, maybe? Or perhaps they were just animals distorted by the dark and my own sleepy imagination. Yet that look, that haunting, penetrating gaze stayed with me. When I finally got to Flagstaff, I couldn't shake off the unease. I looked up local legends and folklore about Arizona's highways and found tales of skinwalkers, shape-shifting creatures from Native American folklore. Could that be what I encountered? I didn't know, and I wasn't sure I wanted to find out. Since that night, I have avoided driving that stretch of highway, always opting for alternative routes even if they add time to my journey. I've also stopped scoffing at tales of the unexplained. After all, there are things out there in the dark, lonely roads of Arizona that defy understanding, and I've seen them with my own eyes. Last night, I was watching TV with my headphones on when I suddenly heard a faint whistling. For context, imagine one as a low note and three as a high note. The sequence went like this. One, two, three, two. I heard it three more times after turning off my fan and TV, which gave me the chills. I couldn't sleep afterwards. Does anybody have any idea about what or who this might have been? I'm located in British Columbia, Canada. At first, I considered the possibility of it being a skinwalker, as local indigenous legends caution about whistling. However, from what I've gathered, they supposedly whistle back only if you initiate the whistling, unless that's wrong. Any insights on this? Also, my dog who sleeps upstairs woke up and paced around the house before finally settling back down to sleep. So it seems like my dog was bothered by this as well. Additionally, I've been catching random whiffs of what smells like sulfur. Initially, I suspected a gas leak, but upon checking the furnace, there was no distinct odor. Every time I detect the scent, I just get goosebumps. 
For added context, my house is relatively old. Some have inquired if I live near the woods. Well, in Canada, our suburbs are often deeply wooded. It's like a blend of forest and a small suburb. I don't really know how else to describe it, but yes, we do have woods here. I'm still not sure what this whistling is, but it's absolutely creepy. It had been an exhausting day of meetings in Phoenix, and I was more than eager to make the drive back to my home in Flagstaff. The thought of my own bed was the only thing keeping me going as I sped down the empty highway. Arizona's night sky was something to marvel at, endless and filled with stars, a stark contrast to the city lights I'd left behind. I was about halfway through the journey when it happened. A flicker of light in the sky caught my attention. Not unusual, of course. Shooting stars are a common sight in these parts. But then another flicker followed, this time a bit longer, accompanied by two more bursts of light. My curiosity peaked, I pulled over to the side of the road to get a better look. I stepped out of the car, the cool desert air filling my lungs as I looked up. At first, there was nothing but the usual celestial panorama, but then I saw them. A series of lights, glowing orbs really, moving in a formation unlike any aircraft I had ever seen. They were perfectly synchronized, darting around in complex patterns that made my head spin. It lasted for maybe a minute, but it felt like an eternity. Then, as quickly as they had appeared, the lights shot upward and vanished, leaving me staring at an empty sky. I stood there, dumbfounded. I'm a rational person, or at least I'd like to think I am. But what I had just witnessed defied any rational explanation. I considered taking out my phone to record the phenomenon, but realized I'd been so awestruck that the thought hadn't even crossed my mind until it was too late. Climbing back into the car, I continued my drive home, my mind racing with questions. Had I just seen UFOs? A secret military operation? Or something else entirely? And why me? Why there, on that empty stretch of Arizona Highway? The questions persisted long after I got home and crawled into bed. Sleep was elusive that night, and when it finally came, it was filled with dreams of lights in the sky, darting around in formations that seemed to spell out messages I couldn't quite decipher. In the days that followed, I scoured news reports and social media, looking for any mention of the mysterious lights, but found nothing. It was as if I had been the sole witness to this celestial ballet. That experience changed something in me. Whenever I look up at the night sky now, it's not just stars I see, but possibilities. Countless, endless possibilities that stretch as far as the universe itself. Whether those lights were extraterrestrial in nature or something else entirely, I may never know. But they serve as a constant reminder that the world is filled with mysteries, and sometimes, those mysteries choose to reveal themselves when you least expect it, under a sprawling canopy of an Arizona sky. Boston Opera House, a place of magnificence where art and history meld into one. Its ornate architecture is a testament to bygone eras, and its walls have witnessed countless tales of passion, tragedy, and triumph. But there's one story that remains largely untold, hidden amidst the applause and standing ovations. It began on a night like any other. I was attending a performance of Swan Lake, a favorite of mine. 
As the ballet progressed, I became entranced by a dancer who wasn't listed in the program. Her movements were graceful, transcending the bounds of the stage, almost ethereal. Every pirouette and leap seemed to defy gravity. During the intermission, I inquired about her, but to my surprise, no one else seemed to have noticed her. They attributed my query to being captivated by the main performers, but I was certain of what I had seen. The ballet resumed, but she was nowhere in sight. That was until the final act. As the curtain slowly descended, she appeared at the edge of the stage, bathed in a single spotlight, dancing a melancholic solo. As her dance reached its climax, she vanished, leaving only echoing silence behind. Intrigued, I decided to delve into the history of the Opera House. Buried in the archives, I found a tragic story from the 1920s. Lillian, a prodigious ballerina, was set to debut her solo performance. But on the eve of her premiere, she mysteriously vanished, never to be seen again. The lore goes that on some nights, when the moon is just right and the stars align, Lillian returns to the stage she never got to grace, dancing her heart out for an audience she never had. Returning to the opera house weeks later, I managed to find an elderly usher who had been working there for decades. When I mentioned Lillian, his eyes clouded with a mix of fear and sadness. He whispered to me that over the years, select attendees, especially those deeply passionate about ballet, have reported seeing a mysterious dancer, always during Swan Lake, always dancing a solo during the curtain call. Lillian's spirit, it seems, is forever intertwined with the opera house, her passion and dedication transcending time. She remains a silent testament to the artists of yesteryear, a reminder that art, in its purest form, is eternal. Now, every time I visit the Boston Opera House, I find a seat in the balcony, gazing at the stage, hoping to catch a glimpse of the timeless dancer, forever trapped between the world of the living and the embrace of the arts. The woods of Maine had always held a special place in my heart, ever since my family began vacationing there when I was a child. The tall pines, the craggy coastlines, and the deep sense of isolation made it the perfect escape from the pressure of everyday life. This year, I invited some friends, Mike, Sarah, and Liz, to join me on a camping trip, blissfully unaware that this particular venture would be unlike any other. We set up camp deep in the woods, far from the well-trodden tourist paths. Our campsite was idyllic, encircled by ancient trees and just a stone's throw away from a tranquil lake. We spent the day fishing, swimming, and basking in the beauty of our surroundings. As night fell, we gathered around the campfire roasting marshmallows and sharing stories. It was then that Mike, a Maine native, brought up the local legend of the Pokemoonshine Lake Monster, a serpent-like creature rumored to inhabit the depths of a lake not too far from where we were camping. It's supposed to be massive, he said, with scales like armor and eyes that glow in the dark. We all laughed it off, attributing the legend to the vivid imaginations of bored locals. But as the fire dimmed, we retreated to our tents, and the atmosphere changed. The woods, which had felt so inviting during the day, now seemed to close in around us, as if hiding secrets in the shadows. It must have been around midnight when I first heard the noise, a low rumble like something large moving through water. I unzipped my tent and peered out into the darkness, my eyes straining to adjust. There it was again, 
this time accompanied by a series of splashes and the sound of something heavy dragging itself along the ground. Curiosity getting the better of me, I woke up Mike and Sarah, and together we grabbed our flashlights and cautiously made our way toward the lake. And there, in the water, illuminated only by the silvery glow of the moon, was an enormous serpent-like form, its scales glistening, and its eyes, two glowing orbs, fixated on us. In a state of collective shock, we scrambled back to our campsite, adrenaline coursing through our veins. Liz, roused by our hurried movements, stared at us in disbelief as we recounted what we'd seen. We need to stay in our tents until morning, Mike said, his voice tinged with a gravity I had never heard before from him. We huddled in our tents, too terrified to speak. That's when the scratching began. Slow, deliberate, and unnervingly close, like the sound of talons dragging along the canvas walls of our tents. The noise circled the campsites, stopping and starting, but always there, a maddening soundtrack to the longest night of our lives. As dawn broke, the scratching finally ceased, replaced by the familiar sounds of birdsong and rustling leaves. We emerged from our tents, visibly shaken but unharmed, our campsite untouched. Packing up as quickly as we could, we left that place, vowing never to return. And while we never spoke of that night again, the experience bonded us in a way nothing else could, a shared encounter with the unexplained forever etched in our memories. Now, when I hear tales of cryptids or local legends, I no longer dismiss them as mere folklore. Because in the remote woods of Maine, we came face to face with something that defied explanation, something that turned skeptics into believers and a casual camping trip into a haunting encounter with the unknown. The leaves had just started to turn colors, and I found myself driving on a stretch of road in West Milford, New Jersey, known as Clinton Road. My buddy, who was a folklore enthusiast, had filled me in on the tales of the area. A notorious 10-mile stretch, it had more legends associated with it than any other road in the U.S. Stories ranged from ghostly apparitions, strange creatures, to even eerie gatherings of unknown societies. It was near twilight, that perfect hue of orange and purple in the sky, when I started my drive. I remember feeling slightly uneasy as the dense woods on either side of the road appeared to close in on me. As I drove further, the tranquility of the fall season began to be overshadowed by an inexplicable weightiness in the air. In the descending darkness, my headlights caught a glimpse of something by the side of the road, a decrepit looking truck from what seemed like the 60s, parked haphazardly by the side of the road. Being the good Samaritan, I thought I'd stop and check if someone needed any help. I pulled over a few yards ahead and rolled down my window. There was stillness in the air, except for the faint whispering of the wind through the trees. I called out, Hey, anyone there? Need help? To my surprise, a coin suddenly dropped onto the asphalt beside my car. I picked it up and inspected it. It was old and worn out, dated back to 1965. I recalled one of the legends associated with the road, the ghost of a boy who had died under mysterious circumstances, and if you dropped a coin on a certain bridge, he'd throw it back. Was this the bridge? A shiver ran down my spine. Just then, the old truck's headlights blinked to life. Its engine roared and it started moving, 
backward. The vehicle didn't turn around. Instead, it backed up at an alarming speed, headlights blinding me momentarily. Fumbling for the ignition, I managed to get my car started and I sped away. The old truck seemed to follow for a bit, but its presence faded the farther I got from that spot. Relief washed over me as I saw the sign indicating the end of Clinton Road. But the coin? It sat on my dashboard, a grim reminder that not all legends are mere tales. It took me weeks to muster up the courage to drive by that road again. By daylight, of course. Whenever someone asks me if I believe in ghosts or paranormal activities, I simply show them the coin, a testament to that eerie autumn night on Clinton Road. The highway stretched out in front of me, a ribbon of asphalt cutting through the Arizona desert. It was past midnight, and I was the only car in sight. The sky was so clear that the stars looked like pinpricks on a dark curtain, and I felt as though I was driving through space, alone in the universe. It was a peaceful sort of isolation. But then my car started to sputter. Glancing down at the dashboard, I saw the needle on the fuel gauge sink dangerously close to E. I cursed myself for not checking earlier. Just as I began to pull over, my headlights flickered and died. In an instant, I was plunged into darkness, save for the dim illumination provided by the moon and stars. Nervous but determined, I managed to pull my car off to the side of the road. I took out my phone to call for help, but no bars. I was in a dead zone. Great, I muttered, contemplating limited options. That's when I noticed it. A soft, bluish glow in the distance, beyond the road, somewhere amidst the cacti and brush. My first thought was that it was another vehicle, but the light didn't resemble headlights. It was more ethereal pulsating softly, like the light of a firefly, but much brighter. Curiosity overcoming caution, I grabbed a flashlight and stepped out of the car, locking the doors behind me. I began walking toward the light. As I got closer, I realized the glow was emanating from a cluster of rocks arranged in a circle. The rocks themselves seemed to be the source of the light, I reached out to touch one, half expecting to feel heat, but they were cool to the touch. As my fingers made contact, the rocks glowed brighter, and for a moment I felt a strange sensation, like an electric charge running through me. Images flashed in my mind, strange symbols, a night sky different from our own, and faces I couldn't recognize. Just as quickly, the visions were gone. Stunned, I stepped back. The rocks dimmed, returning to their original glow. Shaken, I returned to my car, my mind buzzing with questions. When I got back in, I turned the key in the ignition, half expecting it not to work. To my surprise, the car roared back to life, headlights and all. Confused but grateful, I drove away constantly glancing in my rearview mirror, half expecting to see the glowing rocks follow me. They didn't, but as I looked back one final time, I swear I saw them flash brightly, as if saying goodbye, or perhaps until next time. I don't know what I stumbled upon that night. Some local legends speak of spirit stones, rocks imbued with mystical energies, but what I experienced seemed beyond the realm of any folklore. Those glowing rocks and the visions they triggered have left me both intrigued and humbled, serving as a constant reminder of the mysteries that lie just beyond the boundaries of human understanding, even in the empty stretches of an Arizona highway.
My work as a geologist often took me to remote corners of Arizona, places where the roads stretch out into the horizon and the desert stretches out even further. A landscape that could be hypnotic in its repetitive beauty. But that day in September, the land felt different somehow, its eerie emptiness weighing heavily on me. I was returning from a soil testing job, driving my well-worn pickup down a highway I'd traversed at least a dozen times before. Dusk was falling, casting long shadows on the ground and turning the sky into a canvas of reds and purples. I was listening to a podcast about ancient civilizations, their folklore and myths, which usually fascinated me. But on that drive, the words became a monotonous drone, blending into the background as I struggled to keep my focus. Just when my eyes were becoming a little too heavy for comfort, I saw it, a solitary tree standing near the highway. This wouldn't be remarkable in any other circumstance, but this tree was ablaze. Flames leapt from its branches, yet it didn't seem to be burning down. It stood there, a spectacle of fire against the backdrop of the setting sun. I pulled over, grabbed my fire extinguisher, and ran toward it. But as I got closer, I realized something astonishing. There was no heat emanating from the flames. Cautiously, I extended a hand toward the fire and felt nothing but the cool desert air. The flames were cold, or at least not hot. My rational mind grappled with this impossibility. It was then that I heard the whisper, a hushed voice so soft it was almost drowned out by the crackling flames. Help me, it said. I looked around, thinking someone must be playing a trick on me, but there was no one. I was alone with this inexplicable burning tree. Who are you? I stammered, feeling ridiculous for talking to a tree, but unable to help myself. I am bound, the voice whispered, more audibly this time. Release me. Without thinking, I pulled out the small hatchet I kept in my toolkit for sample collection. As the blade cut through the bark, the flames flickered, as if reacting to my touch. Finally, with one last swing, I severed a branch. The moment it fell, the flames vanished, leaving the tree as it was, just a tree. I felt a sudden rush of wind and a feeling of liberation washed over me. The tree looked normal, mundane even, but I couldn't shake the sensation that something extraordinary had just occurred. I took the severed branch with me, storing it carefully in the back of my pickup. That night, I did some research and found local Native American legends about spirits being trapped in trees, waiting for someone to release them. Could it be that I had encountered one such spirit? Rational explanations eluded me, but the branch, still untouched by burn marks, was a tangible, physical proof that I clung to. Since then, my views on the paranormal have shifted. I don't know what I released that day or what it meant, but I do know that the desert is a place of mysteries, some better left unsolved, others begging to be explored. Whatever it was, that fiery visage is etched in my memory, a constant reminder that reality is far more complex and wondrous than we can ever fully comprehend. Deep within the wooded territories of East Burke, Maine, I had heard whispers about a creature that straddled the line between myth and reality. To some, it was just a tale used to scare misbehaving children. To others, it was a very real terror, a memory that haunted their dreams. They called it the East Brook Harpy. I had come to Maine on a whim, escaping the claustrophobia of city life 
and seeking solace in the embrace of nature. My rented cabin, while rustic, offered breathtaking views of the nearby forest and lake. However, as I chatted with the locals, the topic of the harpy would inevitably come up. Avoid the woods at dusk, they would warn me. Curiosity is a funny thing. Despite the warnings, or perhaps because of them, I decided to take an evening stroll in the forest. The orange and pink hues of the setting sun painted the sky, casting long, haunting shadows on the forest floor. It began innocently enough, just the sounds of the forest, the chirping of the crickets, the gentle sway of the trees. But as the sun dipped below the horizon and twilight took over, an eerie quiet enveloped the woods. Then I heard it, a high-pitched, mournful wail that echoed through the trees. It sent shivers down my spine. Following the sound, I stumbled upon a clearing where I saw her, the Eastbrook Harpy. She was a grotesque fusion of bird and woman. Her large, tattered wings seemed too worn to hold her, and yet they fluttered with an eerie grace. Her eyes were deep black pools, filled with a sorrow that was palpable. She seemed to be searching for something, or someone. Our eyes locked, and in that moment a flood of emotions washed over me. Fear, certainly but also a deep sadness. The stories I had heard betrayed her as a malevolent spirit, but up close, she looked lost, trapped between worlds, neither fully human nor bird. The spell was broken by a sudden rustling in the trees. The harpy let out another sorrowful wail, spread her wings and disappeared into the canopy. I hurried back to the cabin my mind racing. Sleep eluded me that night. I lay in bed, trying to make sense of the encounter. By morning, clarity dawned. The Eastbrook Harpy wasn't a monster to be feared. She was a soul in torment, forever bound to the woods, seeking something she could never find. I left Eastbrook with a heavy heart, carrying the image of the Harpy with me. While the world is full of mysteries and legends, one thing became clear. Sometimes, behind the facade of a monster, lies a tragic tale, just wanting to be understood. I don't know her name, nor do I wish to. I'm not even sure if she's female. All I'm certain of is that around 2.30 in the morning, sometimes I awake to find her standing in front of my window. But let's start from the beginning. When I was two, my uncle tragically passed away due to an accident involving a patch of ice at the bottom of a hill. I don't remember much from then, but I distinctly recall dancing at the cemetery during his funeral. Clad in an outfit I was cautioned not to dirty, I noticed everyone's somber expressions. There was a sea of mourners, including children who appeared a bit unusual. Ignoring their oddity, I danced with them, executing the innocent clumsy steps of a child. My aunt, upon noticing, admonished me Stop dancing with the dead. It's inappropriate. The rest, up until I was eight, is based on my mother's account. After the funeral, I would often point out peculiar individuals among us, describing them as old, sometimes hurt-looking people. Given her belief in the supernatural, my mother deduced that I was seeing spirits and advised me to disregard them. I heeded her words until one night when I was eight. I can vividly recall that night. As I lay in bed, I awoke abruptly to a streetlight illuminating my room through the curtains. 
Before me stood a woman in an old-fashioned dress, reminiscent of Victorian times, positioned inexplicably in front of my window, even though my dresser blocked its access. From the back, she appeared ordinary, perhaps a spirit from a bygone era. But when she turned, I was met with a haunting sight. Where her eyes should have been, there were black voids, and her chest bore a similar darkness where her heart should be. While she emanated no threat, I instinctively sensed her abnormality and ran to my mother in terror. Thereafter, I started experiencing nightmares related to my surroundings. Whether it's an animal or human suffering, these dreams always tie back to the land I reside on leaving me emotionally drained. Once, I sought counsel from a priest who suggested she might be a demonic entity blocking my spiritual sight. His advice was to seek spiritual guidance from a variety of sources, including shamans and white covens, given my lack of strict religious affiliation. The uncanny aspect is that when I've researched the histories of places related to my nightmares, they often mirror the horrors I've witnessed in my dreams. Though I discuss my ability to see ghosts openly, I mostly ignore them now, just as my mother advised. It's bizarre yet fascinating to witness figures from the 1800s amidst the hustle and bustle of modern day Vancouver, tangible yet not. Out of an abundance of caution, I've undergone several medical examinations to rule out any neurological or psychological disorders. The results revealed high-functioning autism, but no conditions that could induce hallucinations. I maintain a clean lifestyle, abstaining from drugs, alcohol, and smoking. This leaves me puzzled. Why do I see these apparitions? Is this woman truly demonic? And if she shields me from painful memories, do I want her to depart? Unfortunately, I am left with more questions than answers. In 2007, I frequently traveled between Alberta and British Columbia with my then boyfriend, whom I'll refer to as John. The journey was breathtaking, meandering through mountains, glacial lakes, and impressive rock formations. I mention these details because I have a hunch they're relevant, though it's just a gut feeling. One particular morning before a trip, something shifted in my mind. I can't determine if something external caused this or if I was the catalyst. Although it might sound like I'm describing a schizophrenic episode, I want to clarify that I have PTSD and bipolar too, but not schizophrenia. If this doesn't fit the narrative, it's okay. The day started as any other, but a bizarre conviction overtook me. I felt certain that John was planning to kill me in the mountains on behalf of my father. This idea was preposterous. Neither my father nor John had any reason or inclination to harm me. Convinced of this alternate reality though, I confronted John. It seemed he shared this disturbing belief. He evaded my questions. And as my distress grew, his demeanor changed. His voice altered, and subtle changes appeared on his face. He seemed to morph into someone else, a transformation I can't quite explain. Everything became surreal, like a lucid dream. The depth and complexity of the conversations and situations we found ourselves in were overwhelming. We discussed topics that I can't recall. At times, John seemed to alternate between himself and this other entity, who I whimsically identified as Satan or a manifestation of pure evil. Sounds crazy, right? By this time, I had worked as an escort in the city for about three years. This trip marked a turning point, and I left that life behind. Fast forward a bit and things became even stranger. We had taken a different route, one that John was familiar with from his work travels. 
However, our journey between places seemed unnaturally fast, and the towns en route seemed incomplete or transitional. Time felt distorted. Though in real time, our trip took three days, it felt like a week had elapsed. When we finally reached the city, reality seemed to reassert itself, though not entirely. We intended to pick up furniture, but although I remember having the furniture later on, the act of acquiring it remains hazy. After leaving the city, the night seemed to fall suddenly, and we were back on that eerie road. Our reality became fragmented, shifting between different states of awareness. At times, John transformed into that malevolent being, while at other moments, he was just John. We found ourselves trapped in a looping timeline, one that only progressed when we made the right change. As things escalated, John's intent seemed murderous. I felt trapped in this cycle of dark and light. In my desperation, I prayed fervently, seeking help. Suddenly, I was outside the truck, running along the road, with John, or that other thing, chasing me in the vehicle. Despite the terror, I resolved to keep running, driven by sheer will. Then, abruptly, I was back in the truck with John. The terrifying alternate reality still lingered, but it slowly began to fade as daylight approached and we neared familiar places. There were a few lingering time loops, but we eventually returned home, where time flowed normally once again. John and I tried to process what happened. Initially, we discussed it in depth, but over time, John avoided the topic. The initial belief that he intended to kill me remained unexplained and unfounded. When I recounted the story to my father, he was upset, suspecting that I was using drugs or losing my sanity, but neither was true. For years, I have tried to locate that mysterious high road, but I've never succeeded. On two occasions, I felt I saw others using this road, once with a former boss after a traumatic work incident, and once with someone linked to my past in escorting. Both experiences predated that bewildering trip with John, and I can find absolutely no evidence that that road exists. To this day, I don't know what happened, and I can't explain any of these experiences. Boston's Freedom Trail is a path steeped in history, a two and a half mile long route that takes you past 16 historically significant sites. It's a well-trodden path for tourists, but for locals like me, it's also a popular running route. On cool mornings, the trail offers a chance to immerse oneself not just in exercise, but also in the echoes of revolutions past. It was one such morning, the city still shrouded in mist, that I encountered something profoundly inexplicable. I was nearing the Paul Revere house, lost in thought, when the distant sound of footsteps caught my attention. They were rhythmic, unmistakably those of another runner. However, the steps sounded older, more like the clatter of dress shoes than modern sneakers. Curious, I increased my pace, attempting to catch a glimpse of the fellow early bird. Rounding a corner, I saw him, a man dressed entirely out of time. His attire resembled the colonial era, breeches, a waistcoat, and even a tricorn hat. Oddly, he seemed to shimmer, his form not entirely solid, more like a figure rendered in watercolors. He was not one of the reenactors of the area. Of that, I was sure. The man ran with a purpose, occasionally glancing over his shoulder with an expression of deep concern, as if being chased. He didn't seem to see me, though. Deciding to follow, I kept a respectful distance. The journey felt timeless, every footfall resonating with whispers of yesteryears. As we neared the old state house, the man's pace became frantic. 
It was then that I recalled a tale I'd once heard. A patriot during the American Revolution who had been entrusted with a message vital for the colonial leaders. He was pursued relentlessly, but was said to have mysteriously vanished without delivering his message, changing the course of a pivotal battle. Reaching the old state house's steps, the phantom runner suddenly stopped, his form dissipating into the morning fog, leaving behind only silence. I stood there, heart pounding, trying to process what I'd witnessed. My city, Boston, was not just a guardian of the past. It was an active participant in its retelling. Now, whenever I lace up my running shoes and hit the Freedom Trail, I do so with reverence, understanding that every step taken is not just a stride forward, but also a journey back into the embrace of Boston's history.